Greetings and welcome to ODI's forum today. And we really appreciate the time that you all have taken to be with us. I want to give a few housekeeping rules um, as we're getting started. First, let me just share with you that we were unable to have a captionist today. And in the chat, you will find the YouTube link. And if for some reason you would like to have captioning, um, please go to that particular um, YouTube link so that you can watch us in action and you'll be able to see the captioning at that point in time. The other thing I would ask is that during the presentation, if everyone except for the panelists and the keynote speaker um, would stay with the cameras off and their mics muted, that would be very helpful to us so that we do not have any feedback and or um, people are not necessarily not understanding who is actually the guest speakers today. So I would ask that only the panelists in our keynote um, have their videos showing. Today's presentation um, was the brainchild of my doctoral coordinator, Dr. Victor, or oh, soon to be Dr. Victor Nicola. Um, he uh, is the coordinator of the Legacy Program. And this program was set up for mentees of the program to have some feedback and some, some inspiration, especially during this time, from some of the thought leaders on our college campus. And we brought these people together to speak to the mentees and thought, well, we want to open this up. We want this to come to the entire university campus and let people kind of hear from us with regards to the things that are, are just kind of weighing on our minds at this particular point in time. And so we reached out to our seven panelists and our keynote to, to talk about what they felt would be um, important for the university to know. And so I appreciate that in terms of the type of scope that we have and, and, and their outreach that we're going to be able to have with this message. And so I'll, I want to turn it over to Victor for a moment to see if he has any words that you would like to share, um, especially with regards to the fact that he created this program today. You're muted, Victor. Thank you very much, Dr. Butler. And you're all welcome. My name is Victor Watcher. I work with the Office of Diversity. I personally work with Dr. Butler to help manage the legacy projects. And then at Legacy, our goal is to ensure that the students on campus who are underrepresented and you know, in one way or another, marginalized, you know, especially the first generation students have their voice heard and also pair them with mentors on campus who would ensure that they are, you know, well grounded and have a robust training, not just the academics, but also the emotional and um, every other area of um, their life. So we've been able to do that excellently well for the last um, years that the program has started. So, but this year we decided to sort of take it beyond um, just us. And thank God for Dr. Butler who gave the insights that we should open it up to the whole school. Beyond just what we're doing today, we're also trying to reach out to the faculty, staff, and also students to let them know that we are available to hear them and to give them the right mentors on campus. Today's program was built out of, you know, a sheer need. Uh, we've heard so much going on in the country, the, you know, the um, anti-race campaign, the George Floyd's murder, the COVID-19, so much uncertainty, so much questions. And we thought it was that it would be good if the academic community come together and and actually speak to this. And that's why we brought about seven professionals who will be sharing thoughts 
on how to actually excellently perform better than we have done in time past. And that's what birthed the topic, reinvention. Reinvention to me means if every other things we've been doing before now had, you know, have not actually produced the right results, how then can we, you know, perform better? And that's um, the whole idea. So from the first plenary session, we'll be talking about, before then, the, the guest speaker will be speaking, and his name is Dr. Malcolm Butler, who is a professor and coordinator of a PhD program in, you know, in science, education, and College of Community Innovation and Education. Dr. Butler will be speaking, you know, introducing him more. But one thing he is going to be doing is to uh, create an overview of the whole conversation, reinvention. It's going to be the new normal for us, how are we going to coexist in peace? How are we going to respect each other? How are we going to address issues of injustice? And um, I welcome you all to this um, program. And I, you know, desire that at the end of the program, you know, we all would, you know, have, um, will have the best, you know, we'll, we'll be able to create more value on campus and also help our students and our students ourselves. We we'll also know those who, um, listen to them and they'll be able to, you know, have a, a, a good, you know, training in the long run. Thank you very much once again, Dr. Butler. Thank you, Victor. And uh, so just some housekeeping again. If you are in need of captioning, please go to our YouTube channel to watch this proceeding and you will find that in the chat. If you have any questions that you would like to ask the panelists, please um, also put that into the chat and we will be monitoring those. And when if time allows, we will answer as many questions as possible. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our panelists and then go into our keynote and you will be able to, um, to hear from them um, in a little bit. I would like, them as I introduce them to maybe say why your voice is important. So let everyone know why your voice is important. And then one last thing before we move on, if you are not a panelist, we would ask that you would um, make your camera go to dark and, um, and listen in. So Lee Ross is a professor of criminal justice and he has been at the university since 2003 and is a graduate of Rutgers University. He focuses in on critical race theory and criminal justice systems in response to domestic violence. And is the author of Domestic Violence and Criminal Justice in 2018, and is the editor of Readings in Cultural Diversity and Criminal Justice in 2020. He was a former officer of the United States Customs Service as part of the Treasury Department, and is a recipient of various awards, including the UCF Teaching Academy Fellow a, a CHOPA research fellow and the Academy of Criminal Justice Science Mentor of the Year in 2011. Dr. Lee, Dr. Ross, if you would, why is your voice important? Uh, thank you, Dr. Butler, and thank you for inviting me to be a part of this panel. Uh, first and foremost, I think my voice is important because of my racial identity. I'm an African-American male as you can see, and it's very important to have African-American male role models in the classrooms, especially within the classrooms of higher education. Uh, we have so many issues concerning retention and attrition of African-American males and how they succeed in the academy, and how so many of them do not succeed for a variety of reasons. So if you have someone like Lee Ross in your class who teaches pretty uh, tough subjects like race, crime, and justice, a graduate course I've taught this summer, which was very interesting. And also I teach courses on domestic violence and so forth. As I know, one of our co-panelists, Dr. Roshana Chapel, also has something on intimate partner violence. So she and I'll be talking a lot. But yeah, it's important to have our faces in the class. We can have an influence. One of my graduate uh, school professors who chaired my doctoral dissertation, he said, well, Lee, do you want to go to an HBCU when you graduate or what? I said, well, I think I'd rather go to an HBCU. And he convinced me that it's very important to have black men on white campuses. 
And he kind of directed my uh, trajectory academically from that point on, on. I'm talking 1991. So that's why it's important for me. So thank you. Thank you. Next, I'll introduce Dr. Rashana Chapel. I'm not sure if she's here yet, but uh, she yes, is a here. social professor in the School of Social Work at the University of Central Florida. She has worked as a clinical social worker in the areas of mental health, crisis intervention, education, and disabilities. Dr. Chapel's research contributes to the scholarship in the areas of critical deaf studies, critical race feminism, and the intersections of social work praxis. Chapel's work seeks to fill significant gaps in the literature related to mental health, treatment, disparities, and access to culturally responsive services for Black women and Deaf women who have experienced trauma related to intimate partner violence. She received her BSW, MSW, and PhD in Justice Studies from Arizona State University. And Dr. Chapel, I think I heard you, you're here. I am. And uh, why is your voice important? Um, I think similar to, um, well, first of all, thank you um, for inviting me. Um, I love uh, to be able to talk to different people about, um, especially um, in light of what's happening today um, in this time about why Black voices are important and why um, our mental health and, and different um, things like that are really important. So thank you. Um, but I, I I believe that um, my voice is important, similar to what Dr. Um, Ross said. Um, I am in the College of Health Professions and um, I am the only black person as of now who, ha who holds a title that has professor behind their name. And I just recently um, was promoted to associate professor. So um, somewhere along the line of me coming in as an assistant professor, um, you know, the um, other professors who may have been Black in, our, in the college have left or, or transitioned on and that sort of thing. Um, and so um, given that I work in social work and I teach in social work, most of the populations that we're looking at are people of color. We're working with people of color and, um, you know, Black and, and other people of color, BIPOCs, are coming into this profession to work with these communities. And so it's really important for um, you know, me to be able as a black woman to model why black mental health is important, why, why self-care is important and to, to be able to have students see and to be able to role model professors that look like them. Um, and also to be able to, to help um, some of our um, white students um, understand um, that when we're working with communities of color, we we should not always approach them from a deficit perspective. Thank you, Dr. Chapel. Next, we have Dr. Chinwendo Enyeha, who is an assistant professor in ECE and CS at the University of Central Florida. And he works in the areas of distributed optimization and resource aware control of large scale systems. Prior to arriving to UCF, he was a postdoctoral fellow in the EE department at Harvard and Tufts University. He holds a BS in math from GWU and a PhD in electrical and systems engineering at the Penn, where he was affiliated with the GRASP Robotics Lab he is a fellow of the Ford Foundation, was named William Fontaine Scholar at Penn, and is a past fellow, faculty fellow at the Air Force Research Lab. Why is your voice important? Thank you very much, folks, for the opportunity to be part of this and to share. And without trying to repeat what has been said by the last two panelists, I believe very strongly that as we have these conversations, especially in education circles, that the STEM area is represented. Um, if we talk about the dearth of um, you know, black people, black students, and especially black men um, in education or academic circles, I think the science, technology, engineering, and math fields are where we see that dearth even 
most. Um, so being part of the conversation, coming from that background and seeing the need and trying to identify what the issues are and what role we can play, I think is very important. And that is why I'm here. That's in part why I'm here. Thank you, we're glad to have you. Dr. Leanne Roberts uh, is a doctor and, a, a, excuse me, she is an educational leadership scholar from the University of Central Florida. Currently, she works in, in the education and in, in engineering area as an adjunct professor, and she's the interim director of diversity and inclusion for the College of Engineering and Computer Sciences. And I just definitely muffed that up, but uh, uh, hopefully she will shine a light and tell us why she's here and, and clear up anything I just messed up. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity. I'll just jump right in just to save time to say that my voice is important simply because it can be used to hold individuals in positions of power and privilege accountable for their actions. And more importantly, I'd like to see that my voice is important simply because it can speak on the behalf of those whose voices have been silenced. And so I'm just excited to be here just to be a part of the conversation to weigh in on some of the topics that has been impacting the lives of everyone. And hopefully something good can come out of it. So thank you so much for the opportunity again. Thank you. And Dr. Jonathan Cox is an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology. Dr. Cox is a race scholar, particularly interested in racial and ethnic identities and racial ideologies. He holds a PhD from the U University of Maryland and Dr. Cox's background in higher education, previously working in multicultural affairs. Why is your voice important, Dr. Cox? Yeah. Good afternoon, I guess. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Um, so I jumping right in as well. Um, I would say that uh, my voice is important. Um, I mean, in addition to, you know, being in positions where I'm able to be able to speak with other people, um, you know, bring that voice that is maybe less heard uh, very often. Um, I like to just think that my voice is important because um, I try to be very uh, truthful with how I represent myself, right? And I think that there is a power in bringing your true self, your complete self, which is how I try to empower other students to be able to do that as well, right? And so I think that being able to bring your total self to these conversations um, to our understanding of the world, particularly race, since that's what I study. Um, I think that's just so significant. And again, I like to be able to bring that voice because everybody doesn't have the opportunity to bring them, to bring their true selves to these types of things. So why I have you, and before we move on to the next person, can you give us a little bit of a breakdown um, in terms of how you see systemic and structural racism? I guess that's back to me. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, yeah, sorry. So just uh, very briefly, if you want to think about that. Um, so I know this is a topic that a lot of people are trying to to break down right now, right, and to really understand. So if we think about um, systemic racism, we could see as uh, the complete picture, right? So systemic racism involves systems of oppression that are built upon race and racial difference, right? Um, and so the systems then are all encompassing of all these other forms of racism that we maybe are more likely to think about, right? Like individual racism, how people um, interact with other people, using racial slurs, thinking that ideologies, thinking that some races are inferior, right? Systemic racism encompasses all of that. and and. And underneath of that umbrella of systemic racism is where you would find structural racism, right? And so if you think about the various structures or institutions that we have in the United States, these would be all pieces of structural racism, right? So if you're looking at the criminal justice system, healthcare, residential segregation, schooling and education, all of these various structures that exist. Um, in short, if you were to somehow get rid of all racist thought or all racist people, we would still have structural racism because it is so embedded in the structures and thus embedded in the systems that we have. And that leads to systemic oppression of people of color. I hope that helps a little bit at least. It helps to frame what we're gonna be doing today. And so thank you, Jonathan, for that. Uh, next we have Dr. Ann Schillingford. And Dr. Schillingford, commonly referred to as Dr. S, is an associate professor in counselor education. She currently serves as a coordinator of the counselor education PhD program. Dr. Schillingford graduated from the University of Central Florida and is a Order of Pegasus Scholar. And so to be, to, to be noted that she um, has some pedigree there. 
Dr. Schillingford has written several articles and books, chapters on multicultural issues, particularly focused on disparities among those people of color. Dr. Schillingford is currently conducting research exploring the effects of media exposure to, to police and community violence and the physical and mental health of African-American mothers raising black men. She also facilitates studies, field studies and study abroad to the island of Dominica and has co-edited a book on the journey unraveled college and career readiness of African-American students. And I'm not sure that she is on. Um, if she is, um, she can share the reason why she's here. I'll give her two seconds because I'm not sure she's on as of yet. So because of that, we're going to move into our guest speaker for this evening. Dr. Malcolm B. Butler is a professor and coordinator of the PhD program in science education in the College of Community Innovation and Education. And he'll talk a little bit more about what he, what he does in, in that area. He's, he is actually the director of a program um, in, in the College of CCIE. He's a PhD in physics at the University of Florida. And while in Gainesville, Dr. Butler became fascinated with the idea of growing more scientists, subsequently changing his degree plan and ultimately earning his PhD in curriculum and instruction with an emphasis in science education. Dr. Butler has secured over $6 million in funding to support his research and scholarly initiatives. He has presented his research findings and conducted workshops across the United States, as well as Canada, Japan, the Philippines, Singapore, Cyprus, South Africa, and Botswana. He has co-authored and co-edited three books and numerous book chapters and journal articles. Dr. Butler is also one of the authors of the K to five science curriculum that is sponsored by the National Geographic Science, a research-based program that brings science learning to the life through the lens of National Geographic. During his career, Dr. Butler has served in several appointed and elected leadership positions in his field. He re recently served as the president of the Association for Science Teacher Education and currently serves as the chair elect of the Council of Scientific Society Presidents. Uh, he is a good friend of mine and a phenomenal just person to be around. He always drops some knowledge um, every time I'm with him and he keeps me grounded. And I'm sure that he's gonna provide you all with an outstanding word. And so I'd like to turn the floor over to Dr. Malcolm Butler. All right, well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Butler for that. Um, very gracious introduction and my academic brother. Uh, also want to uh, take a moment to thank ODI, Victor and the symposium organizers for putting together a stellar panel of guests who will speak to this issue of reinvention, the new normal. Uh, so what I hope to do in the short time that I have is to try to set the stage for that conversation that will be happening. And with that in mind, I want to keep my thoughts and comments brief because there's a lot more I could share with you uh, given more time, but I do wanna make sure that the panelists have an opportunity just like they've already done to have their voices heard. So with that in mind, I want to be able to share my screen with you. I do have a few slides, but they're just to keep me on task and to keep me on time here. So let me get this set up. So some initial thoughts for you as I think about this idea of reinvention in the new norm. I'll start by setting the stage that hopefully at the end of my thoughts, you realize for many people, in particular, people of color, people who have been disenfranchised, people who are marginalized, this idea of a new normal and reinventing themselves is nothing new. Indeed, many of these communities have spent their whole lives, many of these people have spent their whole lives inventing and reinventing themselves. And so with that in mind, I, I wanna make sure I give you a little bit of a context for this part of the symposium. First of all, 
uh, the, these kinds of conversations, as many conversations related to, to race, equity, social justice, are a challenge to conduct in a two-dimensional setting. And this is an environment in which we find ourselves. In fact, this is my very first time doing a keynote on this topic without having a chance to interact and talk with the audience. Uh, I'm used to the call and response. I'm used to seeing faces and getting a read for what's going on in the audience and trying to direct my comments in that direction. Amen. Oh, be as it may. <laughs> I know that this conversation cannot be paused while we wait for three-dimensional opportunities. So a little bit of context. Uh, what's really important as a black man is acknowledging my elders and a big part of my elders experiences was storytelling and making sure that my audience knows at least a part of who I am which contributes to what I have to share with you today. So a part of my context for today, today that I think is very important is that according to the federal government, I would be recognized as a first generation college student. Parents did not go to college. My mom went to eighth grade. She was a phenomenal writer. My dad went to second grade, was a phenomenal mathematician. Both of them had lots of life experiences and both were much smarter than I could ever be. It's just that we went to school. That was a non-negotiable. You had to go to school because even though my parents did not have an extensive form of schooling, they realized the power of education. They realized that not only would they be able to provide us with resources in our home, they also knew that there were things outside of our home that we needed to have access to to be able to be successful and navigate this world. And so we not only gained a significant amount of common sense in home, at home, we were also encouraged to go to school and gain some formal education as well. So in that sense, I'm a, a first generation college student by the US definition, the federal government. However, I'm the youngest of nine children. And because I'm the youngest and all of us had to, go to, had to go to college or had to go to school, I spent a lot of time at universities. My sister was 16 years older than me. And so I remember spending many days at the university with her, talking about school, going to college football games, going to college pep rallies. I went to a historically black university as an undergrad, Southern University in Louisiana. And I remember going to step shows. So all of that was a part of my experience growing up such that I knew I had to go to college. That was a non-negotiable. And so the picture you have in front of you is my high school graduation picture. And that picture is significant to me for multiple reasons, but most importantly for me, it represents my family. It represents the hard work of all of the people involved in my life, my village. And a part of that village makes me who I am today. And I have to share with you, again, this idea of being a storyteller as a part of our, our heritage. One particular interesting story that I think speaks to our work today and talking about reinvention and the new normal. In my senior year in high school, which this picture represents, my school was 90% white, about 8% black. And because of that racial mix, we did have many instances of racial tension on our campus. Not large cases, but certainly opportunities for us to be engaged in some very serious and deliberate and uncomfortable dialogue. And during my senior year, when it came time to have our election for our senior class officers, the small group of black students decided that we would have a black caucus. And it was really because we wanted to ensure that at this point in our high school's history, that we needed somebody black in one of the officers. And so what occurred was that we had a cookout. 
the, all the black seniors had a cookout. And at that cookout, we had our own internal election for each office. And our agreement was that whoever we decided to vote for amongst the black students, that all of us would vote as a block. And strategically, the other part of that conversation was that we wanted to put people in place for the Slater officers that we knew would be able to get votes from other students as well. And so as we moved forward, we were able to identify four people to run for office, president, vice president of our class, secretary treasurer and historian. And a couple of weeks later, we actually had the school-wide election. And after the election was held, the principal asked me to come to his office. And the reason for his wanting my presence in his office was to share with me that not only had I been elected president of the senior class, but all of the officers that had been elected were black. And he sensed that there had been something wrong that took place. However, after further explanation, further investigation, he realized that indeed nothing wrong had happened. We had taken a system that had been designed and a situation that was designed to not favor us and reinvented it such that it worked in our favor. Now I'll stop the story there, but I'll leave it with, we were not allowed to have all those black officers. We wound up having to negotiate such that there were two black officers and two white officers that represented my senior class. I tell you all of that because that informs, I think, a part of our conversation today about reinvention. How do we go about navigating spaces? How do we go about functioning in systems or within systems that in many cases, as I've heard many of my friends share, the systems work just the way they were designed. They were designed to keep people out. They were designed to keep certain people in. The system works in many cases just the way it was designed. And so how do you disrupt those kinds of systems? How do you work within them? How do you disrupt them? How do you get them to change? All of those are part of this reinvention. And I think that's a critical part of our work and that we can call upon our experiences in our lives to help us to think about how we might restructure, reinvent, and work within these systems so that we can overturn them. And even in the midst of not being able to overturn them right away to also get them to work in our favor. And that story always resonates with me as I think about this experience and the conversation we're gonna have today. And also informs me that change is possible. Change is possible. I also want to bring a bigger picture to this conversation as well and highlight a particular person who was, in fact, an inventor. Now, Dr. Butler already shared that my background is in science, and so I started my life as a scientist, uh, as a physicist, in fact, and realized there were some other things I felt I could contribute to society, and so I've been trying to do that over, the, over my career. Even in the midst of my changing careers from being a hardcore physicist, I really grew to appreciate people who work in those fields and that is their livelihood, that is their calling. And one of those people was a gentleman by the name of Lewis Howard Latimer. Now, Latimer was an inventor and he was born in the mid 19th century in Massachusetts. He was the youngest child of formerly enslaved parents. His impeccable work as a draftsman and inventor led him to be invited and recognized as one of the 28 original Edison pioneers. Now, the Edison name may resonate with you, some of you, because Thomas Edison is traditionally and historically identified as the inventor of the flat of the light. He developed light systems and electrical systems around the country. Well, he did not do that alone. He had many other people working with him. And these 23 scholars, these 23 inventors, these Edison pioneers 
were the backbone of all the work that Edison did. And one of those people was our dear, dear African brother, Mr. Latimer. In his work with this group, these group of men included some of the key individuals in the development of the electric light industry. Mr. Latimer was a key cog in the wheel. Of course, Mr. Latimer had many hurdles to overcome in his attempts to be recognized for his work. In fact, there were many times in his existence where when he told people he was indeed one of the 23 Edison pioneers, his authority, his recognition, all of that was criticized and indeed called into question. However, even in the midst of those limitations, Mr. Latimer had a lucid sense of his purpose in life, and he also had very clear strategies on how to achieve them. And for that, we owe him a debt of gratitude, gratitude as well as many other inventors, because he did spend a lot of time reinventing and inventing himself. So how does that play out in our lives today? Well, if we think about the experiences of someone like Louis Latimer, and we think about how our lives evolve as we think about reinventing ourselves, there are some key ideas that come to mind for me as, as in, in regards to my experiences growing up and even today that I would like to refer to them as evolutionary keys. And these again were lessons learned over time and lessons that still fit and reside within me today. The first lesson or evolutionary key that comes to mind is that excellent effort is within our control. The idea that there are some things that are beyond our control, but one thing for sure is that if we want to be able to put forward our best effort, that's something over which we have control. That's something that's within our purview. And that was stressed to me over and over again. No, you may not win the award. You may not get all of the accolades, but one thing you can do is put forth your best effort. That is within our control. And I learned that early on in life. Another evolutionary key for me as I've evolved as a human is nothing bad comes from hard work. This idea that as we continue the hard work, and indeed, as we think about what we're trying to do in society right now in terms of, as we've discussed earlier, Dr. Cox mentioned systemic racism, as we venture into and we continue to work in those kinds of vineyards about challenging the systems as they are and overturning them and working within them to change them, that's hard work. And nothing bad comes from that. We look at our dear friends who recently passed, our ancestors who've gone on, people like Reverend C.P. Vivian, John Lewis, all of them who worked very hard and tirelessly to help us evolve as people and as a society, nothing bad has come out of that work. And then a final evolutionary key for me comes from my dear mother. And now you have to keep in mind, I'm from South Louisiana in case you haven't picked up on my accent yet. But one of my mom's favorite things was to give us nuggets of insights and thought to help us to navigate our lives. And one of the ones I remember really well from my mom is she would say, whenever we were challenging ourselves or being challenged was a heap see, but a few know. And what that means to, to me in thinking about my mom's experiences, living in Jim Crow time where Jim Crow laws were in full effect in, in the South, was that a lot of people might see you, a lot of people might interact with you, but there will only be a few who actually know you and know about your work and know what you're about and know who you are. And your challenge is not to get everybody to know your hard work, or to know you who you are, your challenge is to keep doing the hard work, to keep putting forward excellent effort. Because a lot of people will see you, 
but not everybody will know what it's taken to get you there, what you're putting into it. Only a few people will know that. And that's fine to know that a heap will see you. A lot of people will see you, but only a few will actually know and understand and dare I say even appreciate the effort that goes into your accomplishments and where you are. And so some food for thought for all of us. For some people, reinventing is a daily venture. When we wake up in the morning, we start to think about what's before us. We might meditate. We might have other ways of centering ourselves for the day. And nevertheless, of all of that is a part of reinventing. There are say, as I referred to it earlier, as an opportunity to evolve. So this idea of reinventing shouldn't be something new to us. As we think about the new normal, there are lots of things that we've used in the past, lot of, lots of skills, strategies, words of wisdom, encouragement, admonishment. All of those things that we've had in our lifetimes already can be used to reinvent ourselves and what we're referring to in this symposium as the new normal. A second piece of food for thought. Sometimes it's okay to be okay. Even in the midst of striving for excellence on a daily basis, even in times of great need in our communities, even in times of great need for ourselves, the goal of excellence does not go away. Dare I say, we don't tarry away from seeking excellence. However, there are moments in time where all we can do at that moment is be okay. And we have to also, in the midst of those moments of being okay, know that that is indeed okay, to be okay. And then one final food of thought along these same lines is, as Dr. Butler does his work in his office and ODI continues to pursue its work, our panelists continue to pursue their work. The end game is equity and social justice. That's the end game. As we talk about inequities, as we talk about social injustice, we have to keep our eyes on the prize. The goal is to eliminate inequities. The goal is to create a just society. That is the end game. And so as we continue to do our work, as we focus on social injustices, and as we focus on all of these inequities that are occurring in our society, we must not lose sight of the goal. The goal is to eliminate those things such that at the end, we have equitable practices. We have equitable systems and institutions. Social justice becomes the lay of the land. If we think about the words of Dr. Martin Luther King who said, an injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And his words speak loudly to us today because if the goal is social justice, then anywhere where social injustice is occurring is a threat to our overall goal of social justice. So final thoughts then as I bring this to a close is how does one navigate and negotiate a new normal if the only thing that is constant is change? I shared this thought with my faculty a few weeks ago in our newsletter about being able to deal with significant amount of ambiguity about functioning in a constant state of flux. And that flux term is mu very much a layperson's term and it means a lot to us in physics because it means in flux, there's no equilibrium there. You're constantly off kilter. Things are not settled. There's not this equilibrium. Things are constantly changing. For folks on this particular um, call that might have students and ch young children in schools, You've been dealing with a lot of flux and constant change lately. Uh, if you have students in Orange County Public Schools, 
You're also dealing with lots of changes that have occurred just in the last few hours. And if you're a classroom teacher, the same bodes for you as well. And so this environment of constant change seems to be our new norm. Well, how do you navigate and negotiate this new normal? Well, there are many things we can do. Many things we can do. I want to leave us with at least three and hope that the panelists will add to this list, highlight these, push back on them, and speak from their experiences as well. The three pieces of navigation that I use and negotiation tools that I use today quite a bit is number one, know your worth. There will be a lot of people who try to keep you from understanding your status, your role in this society. Dr. Roberts alluded to it in her explaining her voice in her work. Dr. Chapel mentioned it as being the only African American African American in her unit. You have to know your worth. You have to know that you bring value. You bring value for many reasons. Your competence and your lived experiences all speak to your worth. And so we have to be clear, unapologetic, unequivocally, we have value. And you have to walk boldly into that value. So know your worth. Secondly, it's something I've learned from my father-in-law who talks with us about being human beings versus human doings. And we do have to take time to be. We spend a lot of time doing, running from here to there, you know, in this virtual environment and working remotely, it's easy to work seven days a week because work is always nearby. It's important also in the midst of the doing to press pause sometimes and just be, to actually be a human being, to reconnect with friends, loved ones, and even reconnect with ourselves. Part of that is being. And so in the midst of all of the doing that we're being called upon and we're being tasked to take on, it's important for us as we navigate and negotiate this new norm that we make time to be, to actually be a human being. And then finally, as we know our worth, we acknowledge that we have value. We make sure that that is a part of our negotiation and navigating this new norm. And please keep in mind that this new norm, we have lots of skills and strategies that we've used in our previous parts of the chapters of our life to use today in this new norm. We have to know our work. We have to take time to be and do in the midst of all this doing. We also have to assess our commitment to ourselves and to each other because it, it can be overwhelming to commit all of our energy to others and not commit some of that our energy to our own self-preservation. All of the people you'll hear from today on this panel, this August group, has spent a lot of time committed to working and supporting and pushing others forward. And in a part of their pushing each other forward and pushing others forward, I dare to say that they've also had to spend time committing to supporting themselves, to spending some time looking inwardly and circumspectly about the work they're doing and what it means to them and how not only are they adding value to their communities, to their spheres of influence, they're also taking care of themselves. Hopefully, and what I've shared with you today, you have gleaned a few key thoughts about what it means to reinvent in this new normal. I encourage all of us to continue to think about ourselves as a community, as a village, of people who live and exist in the universe of ideas. For truly that is what a university like University of Central Florida is. And all the ideas are welcome. Nothing is verboten. And yet we're supposed to be able to conduct ourselves in a civil way. We're supposed to be able to push towards the beloved community. 
I welcome opportunities to engage in this conversation in more detail with each of you. My email address is in front of you as well as my um, Instagram and Twitter address. I welcome the opportunity to talk with you further. I do hope that what I share with you today at least gives us a platform in some way to further this conversation today and dare I say beyond today. And I know that each one of you on this call is committed to making sure that someday we will have equity, we will have social justice, we will have a beloved community. Thank you. Phenomenal, thank you, sir. My brother, other. And so before we have to lose you, because I know you're not gonna be able to stay on for the, for the entire time, I know you to be a phenomenal mentor. And so my question to you is how do you, how do we help students find their way and to walk in their truth? What, what kind of words of wisdom might you have with regards to that? Well, first of all, thank you for the kind comment. Uh, again, I hope uh, something was gleaned that was good for today's further conversation and beyond. Um, that this idea of mentoring, I think is so critical as we think about our first generation college students. And again, everybody on the call who, who see themselves as mentors. There are lots of things I could share and, and you know that Ken, from our conversations about mentoring and what that means and some of the research we have going on right now with mentoring our young, young men and, and women at UCF right now. I think what's most important for me to share at this time for both the mentee and the mentor is to really see that as a relationship, as a very didactic, organic, two-way relationship where both sides can benefit. If both parties go into a mentor-mentee relationship with the understanding that there are opportunities for growth on both sides, I think a lot more can come out of those relationships. Relationships matter. And relationships don't take a second seat when we're talking about mentoring and we're talking about being mentored. Even at my stage in my career, I still seek opportunities to gain insights from others. Even though I might not see those as mentoring opportunities, certainly they are because I'm looking for someone to help me to find my way. Yeah. And I would see mentees Earlier on in their lives and their careers, they're looking for a lot of, please help me find my way. I have problems with the registrar's office. What's going on in financial aid? Why can't I be a part of this study group? Can you help me make a connection with this professor? And all of those are opportunities for us to mentor them. Yeah. I also see those as opportunities for us to grow as mentors, to develop new relationships with new people on campus, to help us to grow our village, and so the relationships matter. And I would encourage all of us, mentors and mentees alike, to seek those opportunities to grow as mentors and mentees and seek opportunities to ensure that the relationship is one that both sides benefit. There's lots more obviously I could share about that from my perspective. I'm sure these wonderful panelists and my colleagues at UCF will also be able to share more about it. Hopefully that's a starting point and that resonates with some of you. Yeah, well, I appreciate you. You know I do. And, uh, you know, um, mentorship also comes in, in a collateral type of a way in terms of between two people who kind of kind of maybe not see each other as mentors, but in friendship, mentor one another. And, um, you know, I, my takeaway from you is the saying that I hear you say all the time. Then I find myself saying it and I'm like, I have to attribute it to who I've heard it from the most. And it's not originated by you, but you know, um, it's, I think it's one of your, mon one, one of your mantras. Um, to whom? To whom much is given, much is required. To whom much is given, much is expected. Well, thank you. Thank you for your words and, uh, and being a part of this. And, and as we transition into um, the next part of our programming, I wish you well. And um, you did you did your people proud. And uh, I thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you.
at this point in time, I'm going to turn it over to Victor, who is going to show a, a short video that's going to help to move the narrative a little bit further. And um, the panelists who are going to be coming your way are here to champion a, a conversation that would help to our entire community shift gears and restructure our global perspectives in a very, very wholesome manner. So Victor, please make sure your volume, you, you click that button on YouTube or mm -hmm. whatever that makes sure that you everybody can hear you and, and, and show your video. Or you, if you have any words of wisdom to share before it, please do. Thank you very much, Dr. Butler. And thank you so much, Dr. Malcolm, for the awesome you know, insights you've shared. And um, I represent the UCF students and scholars, and we are promising every mentor year that we are learning. And we'll definitely you know, take learnings from today's insights and knowledge that has been shared to become better, do better, and also achieve better results. I'll be sharing the video, you know, now. Just let me share the video. Just give me a minute, please. Okay. And as he gets set up, I will share with you, he probably did this 15 times yesterday and today to make sure that he was able to move forward. But uh, we're going to mention you to the process. There you go. In 1619, when the first Africans were brought to the British colonies by ship to Jamestown, Virginia, they held the legal status of servant. But as the region's economic system became increasingly dependent on forced labor, we descended into slavery. The institution of American slavery developed as a permanent hereditary system centrally tied to race. Millions of black people were forcibly taken from Africa, crammed on ships and brought to the Americas through a dangerous and deadly journey that crossed the Atlantic. Millions died. Once on our shores, slavery deprived the enslaved person of any legal rights or autonomy and granted the slave owner complete power over the black men, women, and children legally recognized as property. An ideology of white supremacy, a narrative of racial difference was created to rationalize and justify the continuation of slavery. American slavery was often brutal, barbaric, and violent. In addition to the hardship of forced labor, enslaved people were maimed or killed by slave owners as punishment for working too slowly visiting a spouse living on another plantation, or even learning to read. Enslaved people were also sexually exploited. The United States Congress finally banned the importation of slaves from Africa in 1808. Slavery was widely considered a gross human rights violation, yet enslavement was retained and persisted. The 1808 Declaration caused the demand for slave labor to skyrocket in the Lower South and the domestic slave trade grew to meet this demand. Between 1808 and 1860, the enslaved population of Alabama grew from less than 40,000 to more than 435,000. Slave traders chained African-Americans together in couples and forced them to march hundreds of miles from the Upper South to the Lower South. Steamboats carried slaves along the Alabama River. Rail routes constructed with slave labor brought hundreds of enslaved people to Montgomery, Alabama every day, turning the city into one of the largest slave trading communities in the United States. Enslaved people would be paraded up Commerce Street to slave warehouses and slave depots. The city's slave market was at the Artesian Basin, now known as Court Square. Enslaved people of all ages were auctioned along with livestock, standing in line to be inspected. Public posters advertising the sale of slaves included gender, age, skill, complexion, owner's name, and price. Slavery in America traumatized and devastated millions of people. Husbands and wives, parents and children could not protect themselves from being sold away from each other. Enslaved families were separated at an owner's or auctioner's whim, never to see each other again. 
the domestic slave trade separated nearly half of all enslaved people from their spouses and parents. In 1833, the Alabama legislature banned free black people from residing in the state, meaning that enslavement was the only legally authorized status for African Americans. Even as the Civil War raged, slave trading in Montgomery flourished well into the mid-1860s. After the Confederacy's surrender in 1865, Congress passed the 13th Amendment, which prohibited slavery nationwide except as a punishment for crime. But in many former slave states, slavery did not end. It simply evolved. Southern whites, angry after losing the war, targeted black people who were largely abandoned by the federal government in the 1870s. For decades, black men, women, and children were tortured, terrorized, and killed by mobs and violent lynchings, oppressed by a system of racist laws and customs. For another 100 years, black people were racially segregated, denied the right to vote, education, and basic dignity. They were humiliated, beaten, or killed for minor offenses or for protesting. The civil rights movements of the 1950s and 60s helped to end legally authorized racial segregation, but racial bias still persists. Today, a presumption of guilt is assigned to many people of color who are disproportionately arrested, convicted of crimes, and sent to prison. African Americans are six times more likely to be sentenced to prison for the same crime as a white person. One in three black males born today can expect to spend time in prison during his lifetime. Police violence against black people is so epidemic that civil rights demonstrations have shut down cities across the U.S. as thousands of people march to protest police brutality. Many states celebrate the era of slavery with Confederate holidays and by honoring the defenders and architects of slavery while ignoring the history of enslavement. The Equal Justice Initiative believes that racial bias remains a serious problem and is a direct and lasting legacy of American slavery and our failure to deal with the history of racial injustice. The Equal Justice Initiative seeks to fall. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. You want to just hit the play again, let it finish out? Okay. Foster an honest conversation about the legacy of slavery, about mass incarceration, and racial inequality, and how it still affects millions of people today. We can confront and overcome bias and discrimination. Please join us in this conversation so that we can move forward together. Thank you so much. Okay, so I'll hand over to Dr. Butler. We shared a video with the mind of, um, you know, establishing a foundation for the next plenary session. We, uh, and the topic of the session is reflections. Rec you know, reckoning with our histories to reimagine our futures together. I will then hand over to Dr. Butler now as he invites the panelists to come up. Thank you. So for the three panelists who are part of this next section, can you please um, show your screens? And Victor, if you could stop sharing, that would be great. Okay. So welcome Dr. Leanne Roberts, Dr. Inyanu, and Dr. Ross. I appreciate you all being a part of this. Um, Victor, uh, yeah, to figure out the screen there. I can't see it. And um, mute yourself. There we go. So, my esteemed panelists, thank you so much. Dr. Rashana Chapel, you're in the next, you're here too. I, I, did I name the wrong people? Yes. I did. Who did I name wrong? Oh, Dr. An Dr. Roberts, I think. Dr. Roberts is right. She should be there. And okay. so should Dr. Ross and so should you, Dr. Chapel. Uh, you're the next go around, Dr. Uh, yeah, there you go. And so my first question to you all is, what do Confederate flags and red MAGA hats mean to you? And what is the significance 
of their removal in the fight to dismantle racism. And I'll let you decide how you would like to start off, who would like to go first. I'll go first. I'll go first. Uh, thank you, Dr. Butler. Before I go, I just want to comment on the beautiful presentation by Dr. Malcolm Butler. He brought back so many memories uh, from my own self. I was born also in the South. And I'm one of 15 children. So uh, he just brought back so many great memories. So I want to thank him for that. Your question, what does Confederate flag and red MAGA hats mean to me? Well, I regret to inform you that I don't own a Confederate flag nor MAGA hat. Um, because I teach course on race, crime, and justice, I cannot help but entertain issues of racism and white supremacy and issues of privilege and how all those uh, intertwine with how we view crime and justice in America. I remember vividly in class once showing a short video, I think it was a song, it was called Strange Fruit and how they hang, it was basically symbolized the hanging black bodies of people that look like me. And when I show students of visuals of lynchings throughout Alabama as the film uh, portrayed and throughout other parts of the South, you always saw in some instances smiling white faces. And I found that to be very ironic. I didn't see what was so humorous about it. But also the backdrop for many of those lynchings, however violent, was a Confederate flag. So I've heard many students who I give the benefit of doubt tell me repeatedly that Professor Ross, the Confederate flag is not about, it's not hate, it, it's heritage. And my knee re jerk reaction to them is, well, the heritage is one of hate. If a mega hat doesn't mean anything to me, by the way, if, if I see a mega hat, I perhaps erroneously assume that, well, that's a person with very conservative or bad orientation, they're probably a Republican. If I could draw a quick parallel here, I would say uh, the removing of the federal flag and how Confederate flag and how it can help us all is like, I guess, a mask and facial coverings and the Confederate flag. I was in the parking lot of Culp in 2004 and a truck rolled off with a big Confederate flag. And I said, what the heck is going on here? I just come down from Wisconsin. Wisconsin, by the way, is a state never did recognize slavery. So we weren't all into the Confederate flags up there. But I said, that is really crazy. Why can't they see that that is offensive to every Black body on this campus, right? So if people today, just to draw a parallel, who refuse to wear a facial covering or mask because they don't get it or they're just resistant, they are ignorant or totally oblivious to the harm that they're causing others. Mm -hmm. So if you appreciate that parallel, you also can appreciate the need for people who wave the banner of, of the Confederacy to remove that as well, because it is equally offensive, it is equally invidious, and in my world, it is equally unwelcomed. Okay. Um, so I guess we're gonna go um, in, in, in order. Um, I guess I can go second, unless you would like to go, Dr. Roberts. Oh no, I, I can definitely wait. <laughs> okay. Um, it's interesting, um, that question. Um, so for, for me, um, I don't have a relationship either with, um, Confederate flags or, or MAGA hats. I don't own any, and I probably did not think they really, the Confederate flags per se, I didn't think that, that you would see them as much, um, until maybe, uh, several years ago. Um, I grew up in, in Los Angeles in Southern California. Um, and so um, for me, I had to recognize and learn about um, segregation and um, some of these um, explicit um, racial tropes um, into my adulthood. Now that doesn't mean that I didn't come from a place that had systemic racism and, and different uh, things, but the explicit racism, um, things like Confederate flags, those sorts of things did not exist um, where I grew up. Um, as a social work professor and, and someone who um, teaches about um, a diversity to social workers, I spend a lot of time trying to get my students to understand 
that our values, our politics, our belief systems are shaped by our experiences growing up. Um, so many people who come to college share the same political views as their parents. They share the same religion, um, those sorts of things, but they don't know what they believe. And so I spend a lot of time in the beginning trying to get them to kind of leave and cleave, if you will, and separate from their, their parents' ideologies and views or to understand why they believe what they believe so that they could actually understand what they believe. So like I said, growing up, I, I didn't recognize experiencing racism. Um, all of my friends were, were very multicultural. The only differences in terms of um, that I recognized is um, sleeping over at different friends' house. There may be, um, the only differences would be maybe the food, the ways in which they prayed and how many generations lived in the house. Growing up, I had friends who had two moms, um, all of those things. And so all of these things were quote unquote normal for me until I turned 18 and moved to a small town in Missouri. That's where I learned um, that I was black. And I tell my, um, my students that all the time. I didn't know I was black until I was 18. I learned all the stereotypes. I was told to be um, in my place. I was told, you know, not to do this, not to do that. And, and I won't go into all of the things that I learned, but it was a very quick lesson um, for me. So um, I think about what Audre Lorde says. She says, when, when we speak, we are afraid our words will not be heard or welcome, but when we are silent, we are still afraid. So we should speak. Because when I was told that this is the way things are here, I was told not to say anything, not to ruffle any feathers, not, you know, when I was getting pulled over by the police, my grandmother said it was because I had personalized plates on my car, not because I was black. So it was very clear to me that the difference between Los Angeles and not that Los Angeles was a perfect world, but that there were lots of historical things in Missouri, where I was, that had been accepted. And I started thinking about the fact that this is where I started seeing Confederate flags. This is where I started seeing monuments and all of these things. And I think that in order to move away from, in, in order to move into a place where we are actually really post-racial, if that can happen, that we have to start removing some of the relics that not only cause racial trauma to people like us when we see them, um, but are also reminders that it is okay um, for these things to be there. You know, the, the flag is not hurting anybody. These things are okay. Can you speak to the racial trauma? Um, so I would say just the views, um, and, and I've a lot of, as a clinician, I hear this from um, a lot of my clients as well, um, and students, that simply seeing a Confederate flag, simply seeing um, a monument sometimes, and even a MAGA hat for me, I have two children. I have one who identifies as queer and the other one has a disability. So when I think about some of the hurtful things that you know, the occupant of the White House has said about these people, it makes me think about, you know, my friend who's a refugee, uh, my children, my black husband, and it, it causes this fear just in me personally. And so I spend a lot of time working with, you know, clients, students, just black people in general, to get them to understand that that, that response, that fight flight that, that's happening to them to recognize what that is and not to do some of the things that we do at, and we're taught as black people not to recognize it and not to practice self-care. So um, not only do those monuments show us or all of these things that you aren't safe sometimes, but they tell us that we can't get to a place in which we can let our guard down or be safe. Thank you for sharing that. Dr. Roberts. Well, I share some of the same sentiments as my colleagues when it comes down to the Confederate flag. But if you don't mind, I would like to weigh in a little bit more in on the mega hat. And um, let me just go in here and say it like this. For me, I'm really trying to come to the understanding 
of what Make America Great Again really means. And um, after watching the video from Victor, I'm trying to figure out at what point in our history are we seeking to return to that was great? <laughs> are, are you hearing that? And so um, I'm looking for individuals and I have been for a while to really get me to a level of understanding about this whole Make American Great Again. And um, what are they really referring to when they say that word great? And so for me, without really receiving, you know, a direct answer to these questions, it really leads me to assume the absolute worst. And so are we going back when we say make America great again, back to the times that we were in slavery, as you just seen in that video, or when we weren't allowed to vote or when we were counted as property? And so just as an African-American woman, to me, that make American great again, those hats honestly should be removed. Um, because to me, it's really, a symbolic, uh, a symbolism, in my opinion, of white supremacy, and to me, a modern day subliminal formation of the Ku Klux Klan. So honestly, wearing those hats and seeing those individuals with those hats on, I really do not get that. And so honestly, I really just feel like it's just a constant reminder of the things as was mentioned previously by my other colleague, you know, that are really traumatic, some of the things that we went through in our life. I grew up in the South my whole life. Um, they were still like KKK rallies, even in my age growing up, I've been called the N word in all different kinds of things. And I grew up with uh, my white counterparts letting me know that the Confederate flag was Southern pride. There was nothing absolutely wrong with that, but um, we shouldn't have pride in the enslavement and mistreatment of human beings. And so why are we having flags and monuments up with dual meanings here. Um, there's other things that can be created or reinvented that can represent Southern pride, but what are you actually in pride about? And so from my experiences and the individuals that I've come in contact with, I haven't met anyone that said something that I felt that was not offensive um, or racially in a sense motivated. And that's just my experience, may not be the experience of everyone here, but from what I've been in contact with, it's just extremely negative. So for me, if we're really going to move forward, um, in society, we have to get rid of those symbolisms of hatred. Um, we have to get rid of those things. It's hard for us to reimagine a future of us together when we still have images of our past that separated us, that segregated us. We have to do something different. Um, we can't keep doing the same thing and expecting different results telling people with lip service how we're going to change, but yet we got flags waving. I don't see that as any different than having somebody paint the, the N word, you know, on a wall somewhere and saying like, you know, hey, we're moving forward in a post-racial society. So we have to get rid of those things and, and, you know, move forward in a different direction. So those are my thoughts. And that's how I'm just deciding to weigh in on this matter. So I could see someone having pride in some lemonade, right? <laughs> Some southern comfort, but some, the, but those are not the those are not the thoughts I go to when when I see those things. It's what I hear you saying. Um, yeah, so, so, yeah. When I see that, I don't I don't see that as southern pride. And, and the individuals that I grew up, I mean, I was like in the deep south, so there were towns we couldn't go to. There were stores you did not go into still, um, even in the '90s and even in the early 2000s. So um, when I see that, it just brings up all of those moments when people who said you know, racially motivated things to you, had these items on, tattooed on their bodies. It, it just doesn't really represent what people are really saying. And then when you ask them about their history, about that heritage, they lack that sort of information. So they're not even informed of their history. So when you're saying Southern heritage, and this is Southern pride, then tell me about the pride that was in that Southern um, heritage in your history, because my history is still a part of your history. And that's something that you got to understand. It's not just like black history and just white history is interconnected and so those individuals are not even educated on even why they're even holding up the flag so you gotta beg the, the question why are we still doing this thing thank you for sharing that um, anything else come up for you all with regards to what you heard the other panelists say that you want to maybe um, have a, a, a different take on or a rebuttal or, or or speak more to so we've silenced the crowd okay so we'll move on to the next question. So we want to expunge narrow-minded, atomistic, independent, Eurocentric thinking, possibly the root cause of all the problems that make life complicated. How do we strategically identify the problems stemming from racism, 
visualize the bigger picture and exact purpose, purposeful change. All right, I think I'll, I think I'll take a stab at that. Uh, well, that's a long question. <laughs> Where are these questions coming from? Uh, yeah, how do we, could you repeat the question just so? Uh, so the last part of it is how do yeah. we strategically identify problems stemming from racism, mm -hmm. right. visualize the bigger picture mm -hmm. and exact purposeful change? All right, I would say, first of all, to a, a address any problem, you have to recognize it, right? So how do you recognize uh, vestiges or instances of racism? Uh, we have, again, in our classes on race, crime, and justice, we have all students every semester take what we call the implicit association test. And this test is on the Harvard website. It's been uh, administered quite a number of times, well over what, 200,000, maybe 500,000 times. And for the most part, it shows that whoever takes this test, whether you're Black, White, Native American, Asian, or whatever, you're more likely, like 75% of the time, to suggest that you have a strong to automatic preference for white over black. And when students receive these results, uh, some of whom are white, they take exception and they take offense. They say, how dare you administer a test that implicitly implies I'm a racist? You know, I'm not a racist. My best friend is black, blah, blah, blah. And the authors of the test always try to point out that the test is not trying to show that you're racist. They're basically trying to show that you have an implicit bias or preference for one race or for another. So back to your question, Dr. Butler, I think first you have to recognize where you are. I've taken the test also, and I regret to inform you that I uh, have a slight to moderate preference for white over Caucasian. Oh, 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 I meant over black. So my students said, Professor, how do you explain that? And I said, well, you know, I went to a Catholic white school. Most of the people in my life who've made uh, offered guidance and so forth, whether it's a baseball coach or a basketball coach or a tennis coach, were white. My first scholarship in graduate school were white. I teach at a white institution. I live in a white HOA with white people. I'm bombarded with white images every night. So I kind of, I can kind of, you know, explain that. But my point is that once I recognize that, that I do have a preference for this over that, I have to guard against you know, showing bias, I've been guarding and treating people differently. So I think recognition is, you know, the first key. The second key is obviously education. Um, how do you, um, how do we uh, go forth from this? I I'm hearing a lot of uh, messages about, well, the importance of being in control of the narrative. In order for a black man on a white campus to be in control of the narrative, uh, he has to be empowered to do so, first of all, through the tenure process, but also as a Black faculty member here, we need more Black faculty. We need more Black professors. We need a critical mass of Black professors who can put the message out. We often hear the term that, well, it's not history, but his story. So we want to be the he. We want to be the one propagating the his story so that we get it correct, if you will, or we can correct some of the uh, misinformation that we uh, digested for centuries. Dr. Chapel. Okay, well, um, I guess staying in order, um, and just to add to what um, Dr. Um, Ross said, it's interesting, when I thought about this question, it, it made me think about a lot of different types of things because um, being um, a black professor on a white campus, um, you spend a lot of time just just getting here, going through lots of scenarios in which you have to um, learn to code switch or learn, you know, what's safe and what's not safe. And and when I was listening to Dr. Roberts, I almost, um, I mean, I felt like I was in church. I was about to say, man, when I was thinking about the towns you couldn't go to. Well, as the 18 year old girl who moved to the small town in Missouri, I didn't know that I couldn't go to towns. I didn't understand that things were dangerous, that places were dangerous. I grew up in LA. I understood you, st you stayed away from um, um, gangs and, and guns, but I didn't understand that you did not go to a rural area because somebody might hang you. And, and, and it's reality as it is as today. So 
I think I take all of these experiences that I have into my classroom and into all of my interactions. Um, I do a lot of anti-racist training um, and cultural responsive training with people working with um, intimate partner violence and victims of, of, of sexual violence, just to get people to understand that we have been trained in this white supremacist structural racism way about everything we think. I too administer the um, implicit bias test in my class, um, Dr. Ross, and I get lots and lots of pushback, particularly from my white male students who are, you know, first of all, they don't don't know how to deal with me anyway. You know, I hear Dr. Chapel is intense and 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 you speak very um, um, straightforward and, and you do this, that, and the other, but no one can say anything but that they learned in my class. It just comes out that it's different. My mannerisms are different. My first semester at UCF, I was told that I needed to learn how people were in Florida because I grew up in California. And then it, it took me about three to four months to start understanding that I had to teach my colleagues how to interact with me and how to treat me. I had to do that because I wasn't leaving and I was told by multiple faculty members that I probably would not get tenure because black people didn't get tenure. So some people said, put your head down and work, you get your work done. Some people said, you know, don't, ruffle any feathers, don't, don't make any waves, you know, and then I printed out the, the quote from Angela Davis that said, I no longer um, accept the things I cannot change. I'm changing the things I cannot accept. And I put that on my wall. I also went into my office and wrote down all of the things that I needed to do. Now, one did say, pick your battles. One did say, speak up when you needed to. The other one said, understand where you are and in what contents you need to speak up. So in, in, in this work that we have to do, I would say to anyone, you first of all have to know who you are and what your value system is. You then need to understand that you are not the only person on this earth. There are other people around you. And when you are making decisions that you think are harmless, but they are hurting other people, that's a problem. That's where the problem lies. So yes, we have to make small change, but we have to also be open to understanding that everything that we want to do may have a ripple effect to hurt other people. Sometimes we have to speak up, sometimes we have to be quiet, but you have to take a side and a position in this if you want anything to change. Thank you, Dr. Roberts. All right, so I it was a lot of words, so I did my best to kind of try to type it to make sure I addressed it all. <laughs> so I'll, I'll start try to give it context, but I guess uh, <laughs> I failed. All right, thank you. It's okay, just bear with me for a moment. So I know you mentioned how do we strategically identify the problem stemming from racism? And so I'm a firm believer of education. Um, you know, here at the University of Central Florida, as you already know, we have the Office of Diversity and Inclusion where we have all of these free resources that have that are available for anyone to be able to take trainings and workshops and certifications to inform themselves on the issues surrounding equity, inclusion, and diversity. We should take um, those opportunities at hand, not be forced to do it, but we should voluntarily want to learn more about it. When you become educated about something that you can be able to identify what the issues are in our society that's causing many of these um, structural inequities in, in areas of social injustices. So we just really have to um, educate ourselves on these vocabulary words and again educate ourselves on our history because if you don't know where you've been then how do you know where you're going so um, and again we don't want to be in the definition of insanity um, 
doing the same thing, repeating the same thing and expecting different results. Something has to change in it. And it begins sincerely with us. Um, next, we must um, take, in my opinion, a broader perspective into understanding and addressing the issues in our society. We can't afford um, to be narrow-minded in our understanding of the world that we live in. It's so much bigger, as one of my colleagues said, than just us. The world um, is composed of many people from various um, different backgrounds and cultures. And we got to embrace that. We we have to understand that. And that's a social responsibility that we must take on. Next, you were talking about visualizing the bigger picture. And as I previously stated with the last question, it's impossible to actually reimagine a future when um, in front of you, you got Confederate monuments and you got all of these different tragedies that's happening around. You have Bruce um, police brutality still occurring things that we thought by now we would be over with in 2020 and when you look at the protest today it looks very similar to what was going on um, you know in the civil rights movement so it, it's very hard to reimagine anything different to to visualize a bigger picture when you just kind of feel like the more things change the more things will stay the same so you can feel kind of hopeless um, in that manner and so um, I believe that we're able to visualize the bigger picture if we take out the opportunity to um, make strategic efforts in a sense to identify and break those impeding patterns within our historical background. Um, and also in addition to that, if we work hard to use the power that has been um, given to us um, through you know, our ability to vote and in, in our ability to freedom of speech to actually um, make a change. And I feel like with the freedom to exchange our thoughts and ideas, we can influence and encourage others to, to dream bigger and to visualize. Um, then lastly, you said something about um, exact purposeful change. So I'm thinking, um, I guess maybe like how we can um, change the world or how we can begin to change our future. So again, like I, I truly believe in us really under, well, first recognizing, understanding, safeguarding, and then lastly executing our power and privilege. I think for many of us as African-Americans or anyone that's been classified as an individual in an underrepresented group can feel sometimes powerless and, and feel at times where we lack privilege. But the truth of the matter is we do have privilege. Um, the fact that many of us are students pursuing an education here at the University of Central Florida is a privilege that many others around the world do not have. The way that we have access to technology and can be informed um, about anything that's in the world at our fingertips, these things are privileges. So I think it's important for us to um, recognize our privileges, the powers that we have and execute them. Um, and I believe that with that, we can definitely see purposeful change. But having powers such as being able to vote and we don't at a state, local and federal level, having powers you know, with our rights to um, equal employment opportunity and we don't go after those positions in which people, because um, I believe that systemic racism is operated by individuals um, in powerful positions. If we don't get take advantage of those opportunities to get an education, to be able to go after those jobs um, that operate those systems of um, racism and oppression in general, I believe that we will continue to see more of the same. So we gotta use our power, we gotta use our privilege. And I believe that that's when we can see purposeful, meaningful change. And so that's kind of my thoughts and how I'm gonna weigh in today. So I think I've talked enough, but um, yeah, that's what I think. Thank you. You can never talk enough, Dr. <laughs> so, uh, so Dr. Butler, Malcolm Butler, in his keynote, talked about the lessons he learned from his mom. What are some of those key things that you've learned? I'm going to make it vulnerable right now. What are those key things that you learned in your lifetime from maybe those who were your caregivers that motivate you and, and keep you kind of reaching for the prize? I'm gonna go with Dr. Chapel first, since Dr. Ross is writing. Of course. Um, it's interesting, um, and listening a lot of times to panelists and they talk about um, their um, you know, their, their parents or their ancestors, the things that they, they learned. Um, my mother was 15 when I was born. Um, and so it was an interesting experience in that I spent a lot of time with my mom and a lot of time with my grandparents. I was very fortunate in that my mom, I, although she was um, a teenager, had um, support of her, um, her parents 
and she was the oldest of five. So um, my childhood was amazing. It was it was wonderful um, in that I was the toy <laughs> for my mother's siblings. So I got to go to school with them. I got to go just everywhere. They would just take me all over the place. And, and the thing that they said to me all the time was that I was smart and pretty. Um, and I realized that them saying that to me helped me to shape and, and form this, this um, idea about myself that I could do whatever I needed to do or whatever I wanted to do. It kind of fostered this confidence in me that even when I walked into um, a place and they said, you know what, you can't have this or you can't do this or, or you know, even moving in and experiencing racism for the first time in Missouri, I knew who I was. And so I think what I learned from that 15 year old mother who was learning to, who was growing up while raising myself and my brother um, was to understand who I was, was to have a confidence in myself and, and to not be afraid to go after what it was that I wanted, regardless to if anyone else said I could have it. Um, I learned that if they shut the door that you would find a window and you would get in there anyway. And that tenacity I think has helped me through things that for a lot of people, they would say, you know what, they said no and I have to, you know, I have to accept that. So I've never learned, I guess, to accept no <laughs> for an answer, um, just figure out another way um, to get things done. So that's that's what I learned. I learned the value in, in being um, a black woman and, um, and knowing her worth. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Who would like to go next? It looks like, okay. I'm still soaking it all in. If you can just give me a few more moments. I, I was going to go in after Dr. Like, Ross did look like something he was getting I was talking, yeah. but I was still muted. Uh, anyway, uh, Dr. Chapel, thank you for those remarks. I enjoyed those. It brought back a lot of memories. I say three things I learned from my mom or my family in general. I said earlier what a big family it came from. The first thing I learned was never to become late for dinner, because if you did, you were out of luck. Uh, they didn't always leave something in the pot for you to scrape. And that was always disconcerting. If you can imagine a huge house, with at least eight or nine of us in there at one point, uh, you know, food and security was a real issue for us, okay? When I came from school uh, during the, my high school days, I stopped up to the library. But I did so for a reason. I stopped up because the library was warm. The library had beautiful lighting. The library had stimulating books. And the library had a vending machine. All those things were accessible and they were, uh, needed by me. You go home, the pitch is totally different, right? Some days you go home and the lights are off or there's no heat in the house, there's no oil in the tank, you know, because I was in New York and it's a different reality. So I learned to value the nurturing environment of a high school and a library. But two of the things I learned, one is uh, God has blessed me so I can be a blessing to others. And I can't uh, say or expound enough the fact that I'm so grateful or the trajectory in life that the Lord has taken me on because it provided an opportunity for Lee Ross to support and sustain himself, but also provide an opportunity for Lee Ross to support his family and to make his family proud of him. And things like that, those intrinsic rewards and attributes, they can't be measured and they can't be um, valued, if you will. So I'm very proud of that. And the last thing that I'm very proud of is what my mother always told me and still other people tell me this today, is that don't let anyone steal your joy. And by that, I mean, when you're in a good place and people know that you are in a good place, they're gonna to try to mess with you. People are haters because that's what they do. I mean, that's what haters do, right? But I think you gotta forge ahead, like Dr. Malcolm Butler said earlier, you know, be the best you can be and just stay on course. I read a verse this morning and it said, um, be careful of what you let affect your heart and the uh, author of that verse was talking about how we gotta be careful about what we see. You talk about all the Confederate symbolism and the hate crimes and so forth. It's about careful what you hear. What are you seeing every day? What are you listening to every day, whether on social media or some of the website that's affecting your heart because all of that resides in your heart and can affect how you treat others, how you respond to the world. 
So again, I would say to everyone on this call, don't let anyone steal your joy. Can I just say that um, I didn't necessarily know you were a New Yorker until you just said New York. Really? Yeah, I heard the accent very clearly right then and there. Yeah, I think I tried with my life from Alabama, Tuskegee, Alabama, to New York, to Wisconsin, to Florida. So it's a triangle. Uh, <laughs> Not <hey>. a perfect triangle, <laughs> <laughs> but a triangle nonetheless. All right, Dr. Roberts. All right, so um, one of the things that I've learned um, from my parents is the fact that you gotta work twice as hard. I don't know if anybody can relate to that, but from, my, from the time I was a child, um, you know, I was excited coming home and, you know, I brought a C and my mom was like, I didn't have a C child. I didn't have an average um, child. You have to do twice as good as your peers. And I went to a predominantly white school growing up, private school growing up where it was only me and maybe two other families uh, that went to school there. So um, my mom said A plus, that was it. So where everyone else family was doing great, I had to do twice as hard. I couldn't watch TV even in high school. So um, my mom just said, you know, you're an African-American woman in a society that is dominated um, by whites. You just have to do more. You have to dress for the job that you want, not the job that you have. Have, how you dress will be addressed, how you will be addressed is um, based on how you dress. So some of the little Southern things that we um, talk about a lot here. Next, um, what my mom always used to say was, um, be the change that you want to see in the world. <laughs> And I, I'm pretty sure she got that from someone else. Um, I wanted to say John F. Kennedy, but anyway. Um, <laughs> but she was like, um, be that change that you want to see in the world. Many times we want to play the victim. And my mom said, you will not be a victim. Everything that you need, God has already given to you. It is already inside of you. You can be whoever you want to be. Forget that glass ceiling. You can break it. Don't expect someone else to come and be that change. Don't sit back and wait for someone to give you a hand up. You got to get out there and do something. And so that's why I was really pushing everybody to, you know, know your power and your privilege and actually use that. There's so many people that wish they can walk and talk and see and how can we have these different things and we don't use it to the betterment of our society. So um, that's, that's one thing. And then um, the last thing was um, she, she and my dad always told me it was, it's better to be, um, I wrote it down, asked up than to be asked down. And so that was the humbling thing because many times we always asking if we can have a seat at the table or can we be here or there? And so my mom's like, just sit down anywhere. Um, it's better for someone to ask you, why don't you come here and sit at the right side of the table? You understand? Um, so um, I try to keep those things before me, but those are things that, that I guess I wanted to share with everyone here today um, that I still use today. Um, some of the things my, my parents um, have shared me primarily my mom <laughs> definitely yeah, thank Dr. you Roberts I was just add I appreciate your remarks I was just add that I was taught not to ask for permission but to ask for forgiveness <laughs> yes and that has got me in a lot of doors Bridget. sorry <laughs> I'm sorry I'm so about. so you know as we look at what has kind of helped us grow as as African Americans as black Americans um one of the things that I saw in the theme of what you all were talking about just now is um, kind of the, the, the black church. I think I saw head nods and acknowledgements of what God might mean and what religion means in your lives. How has that uh, coupled with resiliency been kind of the marker of the black community? I mean, what are your thoughts about what religion and um, resilience really means in the black community you know i i would like to actually say something i want to say to uh, dr roberts that was gandhi um that thank you gandhi thank you gandhi. Uh, it was actually the um it was one of the mantras of my phd program my phd was in um, social justice and so that was um what we were inspired to do um be the change that we want to see yeah. so Thank you for that. saying um, to answer briefly your um, question, Dr. Butler, I think uh, for some of us, um, we have myself um, a very complicated um, um, history with religion, particularly um, in the black community. 
Um, I, as many Black people, grew up with um, family members who went to church and, and kind of dragged you to church and, and, and basically say, you know, this is, is, this is how you become a better person. Um, but I, I think growing up, I was acutely aware of um, systems and also um, hypocrisy and um, some of the um, discrimination that happens in church. As I said, one of my children um, is identifies as queer. Um, and you know, before I had that child and before I knew, um, they're 22 now, but <laughs> before um, mothering a queer kid, I knew that when I sat in a church and they said, this person is wrong, this person is wrong, this person is wrong. All I remember is actually reading a Bible that said that Jesus loved everyone and accepted everyone for who they were. And so I spent a lot of time, my husband and I, trying to find places in which we felt comfortable. And I know that that there are um, great churches and they don't all uh, preach fire and brimstone. But as a clinician, um, there's a lot of um, still practicing conversion therapy that goes out. Um, there um, is in some statistics show that among black women, the HIV rates are much higher because of um, not talking about the fact that people do have sex, the fact that that people have sex before marriage, the fact that 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 there are black gay men who aren't um, um, or or men who have sex with men who don't necessarily come out and say that. So, um, for as much as I, I think that church has a wonderful history of helping a lot of us with resiliency and um, with these things, um, it's really interesting that it also fosters um, judgment that I think that's really difficult for uh, people. Um, and it, funny story, uh, my husband and I, when we first got married, we, we went to church a lot, <laughs> um, um, so much so that um, financially it was almost difficult to tithe and do all of those things that were expected of us. But I think what um, had us take a break until we found the right church was the fact that our, our daughter, our oldest daughter is deaf. Um, and so simply finding a place in which she felt included that had sign language interpreters or that didn't expect me to be the interpreter became very difficult. So like I said, my my history, which, you know, for, for some people doesn't sound great <laughs> about uh, church as much as, as I love spirituality and I love um, people and I understand the benefits of it. I also know that we still have uh, work to do in some of those in some of those areas. Thank you. Who would like to take that on next? I'm hearing silence, so maybe neither one of them would like to take it on. I'll give it. I'll give a stab. Um, yeah, uh, the church has been a, a foundation in my life, and certainly my family's life. Um, yes, I was born in New York, but we didn't move to New York until 1968, when Dr. King was killed. So we had uh, had known what a, a racist South looked like. And by the way, New York also has pockets of racism. <laughs> It's very segregated, in some cases, hyper-segregated, let's be quite honest. But yeah, I mean, you had to have a foundation somewhere, and that was it. Two songs that come to mind, one is uh, by Hezekiah Walker, God Favors Me. And I really think that when you look back over your life and where God has taken me from the, I guess, the bushes, to use my wife's term, the bushes of Alabama, to the skyscrapers of New York City, uh, I think God was always looking out for you. And then you have people like Tasha Cobbs who writes a song, uh, he, know, he Knows My Name, you know, God Knows Your Name. And that just tears me up. I'm on a bike path and I'm listening and the adrenaline's flowing and I'm getting that high, that athletic high you call it or whatever. And I hear that song in my ears and it just says, um, it just says that he knows your name, that no matter what uh, is confronting you, no matter what your trials and tribulations are, no matter where you come from, that because you believe that the Lord knows your name. So that's my take on that. Beautifully stated. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'll, I'll just weigh in here. I mean, um, going to the topic of today, we all know that at some level, you know, um, many of the slaveholders, you know, use the Bible to justify slavery, the oppression, and many of the um, slaves could not understand, could not read or write for themselves to know what was in there. So a lot of times scripture was twisted, but I'm a firm believer of Romans 8, 28, all things work together for a good to them who love the Lord and who are called according to his purpose. So um, even though it might have initially been used in our historical context, maybe to oppress us, um, it can definitely be, um, be used to progress us and help us to endure those tough and difficult times that we went through um, in, um, in the face of opposition and challenges. And so I can say for like the African-American community, well, let me not speak for them, but I'll speak for myself, is that um, I understand the historical context of it and, and, and all of that and how it's been involved with us in our history. But to be honest with you, um, there's, a, there's good that you can see in almost anything, um, depending on how you look at it. And um, I share the same sentiments with my colleagues, um, but it has gotten me through and it's still getting me through um, difficult times, especially what we're living in right now uh, with all the protests and everything around us. So spirituality in general um, are great opportunities for you to um, reimagine, um, for you to be encouraged to keep pushing and progressing. Um, it's an avenue that you can use to meditate, to recharge. And I, and I think Dr. Butler, uh, Malcolm Butler was talking about in his presentation, what are we doing to preserve ourselves? What are we doing to take care of ourselves? And so um, that's one way that we can do it if that's our religion of choice um, to help us to be able to continue to do the good that we do as advocates in the field of um, equity, diversity, and inclusion. So that's my take on that. I'd like to uh, um, say something else too. Um, I know um, in, in talking about my, like I said, my, my history um, did not, um, didn't necessarily want to point, uh, paint a anti-church vibe. And I don't think I did that. Um, I'm just very um, cognizant sometimes of, of some of the mixed messages that come out and that some people feel um, included and in, in, in some don't. And in my, um, my practice, um, I spend a lot of time trying to make sure that people um, find what works for them. And sometimes um, practical church or church as we know it isn't always that. But in terms of um, spirituality and growth and those sorts of things, I think that those things are all very important. So I just kind of wanted to um, put that out there. I didn't... Um, um, I didn't feel that I, I painted myself as anti-church, but I wanted we to. Duly noted. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, I would add that you're you're not anti-church at all. That I've had I written a chapter about religion is the mess of violence and double-edged sword. And some of the research in area shows that if you are black, you're mostly more likely to show uh, uh, attitudes of you know homophobia uh, and how you know you use the Bible to uh, I guess. Uh, I guess what uh, justify criticize those who are not conforming. So yeah. I see where you're coming from, and it's very real, by the way. Yeah. So we have about five minutes left in our hour, and um, we want to open it up to questions if there are any. But there was one question in the chat that I want to ask you all. So be mindful that we need to end in about four minutes or so. But how do blacks limit the telling of our history as told from white perspectives? in order to sustain cultural philosophical preservation. When you read it again, I, I'm seeing, how do blacks limit the telling of our history as told from white perspectives in order to sustain cultural philosophical preservation? Wow. Um, I, I think that we have to continue to do what we're doing. Um, I mean, a lot of pushback that we're getting from um, Black Lives Matter uh, protesters are, you know, the fact that it's not comfortable and, and, and most particularly um, because they're saying, well, we don't understand um, what's what, what you're trying to do. You're trying to say that America is horrible and we want to um, 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 paint um, this view of um, 
I'm sorry. Um, um, we we don't want to to show the truth of of what's going of what's going on or what reality is. So in order to move um, to that, we have to continue to um, tell the truth, to continue to expose the things that um, aren't truthful, to continue to um, make people feel uncomfortable, not intentional, but to say, you know what, those monuments or those, those hateful images are hateful images. And we know that, you know, you don't necessarily want to hear that, but this is what really happened. Um, our ancestors are amazing storytellers. And if, you know, we sit down and we get those stories, they'll tell us the truth of what happened. Somewhere along the, the way, people will, will twist the story, um, particularly if it makes them look bad or if it makes them feel bad. And so continuing to tell the stories, continuing to lift up um, um, ancestors, continuing to get marginalized people's lived experiences out there, um, that's how we will actually slowly change the narrative and go from, you know, um, what we were told to what the actual um, reality is. Excellent, excellent. Any others? I agree with Dr. Chappell. I found myself agreeing with you guys, Dr. Chappell and Dr. Robbins, all day. Uh, there's something wrong with this picture here. <laughs> but yeah, to, yeah, yeah, you gotta continue the narrative. But for me, it's whoever's in charge of the narrative. Uh, who gets to tell the story? Who gets to write history? I mean, now Black Lives Matter, they're trying to rewrite some of the history because it wasn't all that. And we all know it wasn't all that. And even Dr. Butler commented earlier about how, uh, you know, the invention of the light bulb, Thomas Edison didn't give the brother, you know, full credit for the filament part. So yeah, it's who gets to tell the story, right? And who gets the last word, if you will. So I think it's very important. Uh, but with regard to the Black Lives Matter movement, I just want to say this, that we get it. And I think we all appreciate it. We're all on board with it. But I just had a colleague time at me today. He's a very conservative colleague. He said, well, Lee, what about all the black kids killed by black gang members and drive-by shootings in Chicago, Illinois, and other places? Why doesn't their lives matter? Why aren't they taking the streets on that? I said, well, that's an excellent point. But I think the Black Lives Matter in its origins was trying to address police brutality and the killing of innocent black men. And that the issue you're raising, i.e. the black children, also matter, of course. But perhaps there should be a separate movement, if you will, dedicated to those lost lives. So I would like to get your thoughts on that, because otherwise it does come off as Dr. Chapel suggests that we're trying to push one agenda over another. All lives matter. We're about my little boo-boo who also got shot last week. I don't see you demonstrating for him. And that's his argument. So what would be your response? We're going to leave that to the next panel, because we're <laughs> We're coming up on the second hour, and um, I'm sorry. I do want to try to transition away. So I want to thank you all for your time. You've given us something thoughtful and provocative to think about, Dr. Ross, and um, and so we will definitely take that in. I want to thank our viewers that are watching on YouTube as well as I, as we transition into the next part and for sticking in there with us. Um, and so we, we're happy that you're here, and we thank you for that. Um, for those questions that are coming into the chat. We'll see how we can change that into uh, what's happening with our next panel. So thank you, panelists. Your words of wisdom have been phenomenal, and, uh, and I can't appreciate you more. And so as you all move away from um, the viewing public, um, just know that, it's, that we are sending you off with love, and, but we got to tell you to go. So goodbye. And I would like to call in our next panel. So, Dr. Cox, Dr. Schilligford, Dr. Inyeha, where are you? I'm here. And I'm, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm in, in Haya, in, in Yelia. Uh, it's getting better. It's getting better. <laughs> I, just, I apologize. I, I really do. I, I will um, try to get better before the end of the hour, for sure. Um, and so thank you all for coming on. Um, I don't see Dr. Cox or Dr. Schoenford. Are they here? Oh, yes, I'm here. All right, so here we go. So the next part of the panel discussion is talking about reinvention, confronting systemic and structural racism with holistic excellence. 
And so the question for you all, and it's kind of long, but the question's at the end. So for 400 plus years, white Americans have been called on to fight the machine known as systemic racism. Today, many ask to be taught what to do. Black and brown people have tried for many years to be the teachers, yet lessons go unlearned. How does white America really need to learn this particular lesson? What do they really need to learn this lesson? Ask your um, question one more time. So the question is really in terms of the fact that the people, black and brown individuals have been teaching black history and or history for us to be seen as um, equity partners in this here America, right? So the question is, there's an, there's an unlearning process that needs to happen. So how does white America really take on the learning lessons? How do they become vulnerable and learn the lessons that are necessary? Um, is that something that you believe comes from people of color or is there some work that they need to be doing with regards to that? Sure, I'll jump in. Um, so, I mean, I think, uh, you know, there is work that white Americans need to do, right? If we just want to state that unequivocally at the beginning, right? No matter who else may need to do work, white Americans really definitely need to do this, right? Um, as you were saying in your question, um, I mean, these issues, right? Racism, uh, particularly the way racism exists in the United States context, it has existed since the, we'll, we'll say, quote unquote, founding of our country, right? Racism was built into it. Uh, so it's been around, you know, since the beginning. So black, brown, other marginalized people have been talking about sharing these things, studying these things for decades upon decades upon, or for centuries, right? And so uh, the work is out there, right? And so what we really need white people to do at this point, white Americans, is to, to take some ownership for this, right? To understand that they are, there are things that they can learn themselves, right? Um, like I talked to, when I talk to a lot of other people now, um, students and people that are not in, in school um, as well, uh, Google, is an awesome tool, right? Like, there are ways that you can go find this information because it exists. Um, and so the excuse should never be that the information is not there or I don't know what I should be able to do, right? There may be, you may struggle a little bit with, you know, how to implement certain things or what you can do, but you can go find that information, right? Um, and so you don't always need to ask a person of color, although that could be one good source you could look at as well. Um, but white Americans need to take ownership of this, right? I um, mean, a part of this you could look at is a uh, racial stamina that needs to be developed in white and most white Americans, right? Some white Americans have uh, a really well-developed racial stamina because they have talked about race a lot with different people. They have experiences with friends and family members um, who are people of color, um, right? And so they have built up their own ability to continue to talk about these things, right? But the vast majority of white Americans have little to no racial stamina, right? Because as the dominant racial group, they don't have to know about or understand their own race. And so we need white Americans to really kind of dig deep into themselves, um, knowing that it's gonna be an uncomfortable process and an ongoing process. It's not something that you're going to just learn and be done with, right? This is constant forever learning that happens, right? You're always gonna be engaged in doing um, these things, right? And well, becoming these things you never will be. So what you're right. saying is not the easy bake oven. No, absolutely not. <laughs> but you have no. to get in there and, and, and feel the fire a little bit. Absolutely. All right, others. It, it takes it takes a certain aspect of of listening and learning. Um, I remember I attended a a conference one day once one time one year, and um, the presenter said, in order to address diversity and inclusion, the first thing that you have to do is listen and listen to the stories of those who you want to learn about. So really listening to what is happening. I, I do agree with Jonathan that you have to take ownership. So that awareness that there is a problem needs to be first and foremost. Acknowledging that there is a problem. Um, listening to find out what is it that I need to know? What is it that I need to learn about systemic racism? Um, that is very important as well. And so immersing yourself in different communities 
meet, reaching out to different colleagues and, and, and talking about those things, sitting with your discomfort, like Jonathan mentioned. You know, if you, if you want to learn more about systemic racism and, and what you should or should do about it, um, you have to be able to be uncomfortable. And if you have not gotten to that place of feeling uncomfortable, you, you're not quite there yet. You're not quite ready yet. And so it, you, you've got to be able to be uncomfortable in learning and experiencing and understanding what people of color are experiencing through systemic racism. So can you just talk to a little bit about what that discomfort really is? What, so we tell people to sit in that pain, we tell people to sit in discomfort. What is it really? Because I think that's the lesson that they want to hear, right? Because I think so many times we as Black Americans are brought to the table to kind of share. And you Teach me today. You got to teach mm -hmm. me how to do this. But really, the, the things that we are teaching come from our vulnerability of living the life, right? And so what, what comes with that discomfort? So I'll give you an example. Um, last fall, I taught the, the multicultural counseling course. And um, one of the terms I think I, we mentioned, we talked about was monocultural ethnocentricism. And I had, let me see, probably 98% white students in that class. And when we discussed that term, the students started to, to step back. There was a lot of silence in the class. And so I had to challenge, what, what, what are y'all silent about? Because you know we were all engaging and discussing before. And I've just mentioned the term, which really highlights how the um, white majority sees themselves as the superior race um, in the United States. And so we had to talk about that. And a lot of the students mentioned how uncomfortable they were just listening to understand what that term meant and what it meant for them. So, so my challenge to them was put your, yourself in that space now. Now that you know what that term means, put yourself in that space. And they were very uncomfortable in, in, um, in, in, in talking about, well, that has nothing to do with me. You know, that was, that, those were my ancestors, those types of things. And I said, but you are here now. Racism is still here now. It's happening to your friends. It's happening to your, your classmates. It's happening to your instructors. You are part of the community. So you are part of it. Um, and so let's, let's try and understand what's going on. And so for them, that discomfort was um, understanding that there are things happening that they, they may or may not have contributed to, and they don't know what to do with it. I don't know what to do with it. I thought I had it all. And now I'm recognizing that I'm, I'm part of the problem and I don't know how to fix it. And I don't want people to see me as the, the troublemaker. I've never seen myself as a troublemaker. And now you're telling me through this class and through this, this terminology that I'm part of the problem. What do, you, what do you want from me? What am I supposed to do with this? And so I prefer to just be quiet right now and instead of saying the wrong thing. And, and that's another thing we can talk about, saying the wrong thing. What, what, what is it that I could say that could get myself in trouble? So, so that's been my experiences in, in that level of discomfort. Thank you for sharing that. Re um, Representative John Lewis said, get into some good trouble. So be a good troublemaker. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I'm just echoing what some of my colleagues have said. Um, I think it would be important for white America to, um, white America today, um, to take ownership of where we are as a country. Um, and taking ownership means, even though people might look back, and I've heard this comment made several times, I was not responsible, that happened long ago. You know, that's, those are very common mantras today. Um, they should realize that and taking ownership means accepting some responsibility. And in so doing, realizing that to meaningfully engage in the conversation, um, very um, costly um, sacrifices will need to be made. And by sacrifices, I mean uh, making decisions or engaging in a way that as white America, the majority group, the privileged group, they feel it. An example might be, you know, we've been talking about churches and what, you know, the um, faith life or faith communities mean to us. It may mean a predominantly white church deciding to, for instance, forego hiring another youth minister to support a social worker um, in one of these um, police reading communities, right? Um, and another thing that um, perhaps happens to be on the news today, I think thanks to Senator uh, Tom Cotton from uh, wherever, whatever state he's from, uh, it'll be important to think of a way of incorporating uh, curricula on race 
early in uh, the education of children. Um, it's very easy to grow up and uh, you know see the uh, see the disparity, but get comfortable since you you're not directly affected. But I think starting early to um, irk them or get them thinking about this as they become adults would be an important step to take. Um, it's not going to be a popular move. It's always easy to be comfortable and avoid these um, conversations. And I can see parents saying, well, no, as children, they shouldn't be bothered by that now. They should just learn to play together and do all that. But we know that's not the reality. It's what we hope for, but it's just not what happens. So those are some, a couple of specific things, I think, um, what America would need to do to meaningfully engage. Anything short of that uh, feels like just keeping the status quo. Okay, excellent. Thank you, sir. Um, so next question I have for you all is, what particular measures would you like to see UCF take in creating and sustaining more inclusive and enriching learning environments for our students? One of the things that I've heard students mention is representation, seeing faculty who look like them. So we've got, you know, we talk about UCF being um, diverse. Um, we're, we're talking a lot about staff. I remember a few years ago, I sat at the, um, the arena during the students' graduation, and I looked at the folks who were up on the podium. And um, outside of then Provost Dooley, uh, everybody else, looked white as white to me. And I wondered, I thought to myself, that does not represent diversity and inclusion. You know, how can we say we're a diverse institution with, you know, over 70,000 students and, and, and these are the people who are sitting out on the podium representing the highest of the high of, you know, of United UCF. And so I think it, that to me starts, it's, it's got to start there. If we're going to talk the talk and I appreciate ODI with what you all are doing um, to address diversity and inclusion at UCF, but we really have to start in terms of the opportunities that we have to diverse the, the faculty, open up the, the, the avenues for faculty of color to go up the ranks so that students can see that representation in the classrooms um, through research and so on. You speak to mentorship there in terms of helping to help people raise up into the ranks as well. So thank you, Dr. Cox. Sure, sure. Um, so, I mean, I think there are lots of things, right? How much time we got um, that we could talk about um, that I think UCF could, could do to move um, into, you know, creating a more uh, inclusive environment, right? Um, so one of the things I've actually saw in the chat that Dr. Ross put in suggestion um, that some other students in California, other institutions have for courses that all students must take, right? Um, and I believe that UCF has a diversity requirement um, for certain majors potentially, but it's not for everybody, right? So that could be something UCF could look at is implementing some type of course or more preferably uh, a few courses that students would take that are related to diversity, but um, in a sense, not this watered down version of diversity that we're seeing now where it's increasingly including literally like everything under the sun that is different, uh, but more strategic diversity, right? So specifically, what are the issues that UCF needs to look into, right? So as Dr. Schillingford just said, uh, the, the representation, um, we don't have enough people. So maybe looking at race as one of those, right? Issues with gender or sexuality, right? Those could be some things that we could have people look at. Um, you could also, in addition to um, improving uh, representation for faculty and staff, which is, you know, quite abysmal, um, our students aren't there either, right? I mean, we don't even have a percentage of black students at UCF that is representative of how many black people um, there are in Florida, right? And, you know, UCF prides itself on being a point of access for Floridians. Um, and so, you know, we could do things like this that would really help us, right? Other things that I've, I've fought for recently um, is our hiring practices, right? And so not only just saying that we need to increase uh, the representation across the board for faculty and staff, particularly in upper level, um, but changing the way that we go about doing the hiring, right? And that starts from the ground up before you even release a position description. Um, that's where that work starts, right? How are you formulating that? Who's on the committee, right? Is the committee diverse? Does the committee have different people, right? You want to look at all these different things. And so those are some of the measures that we could take, I think, to really start to create this. Um, and then maybe all, lastly, I would say just, uh, again, that idea of listening that was brought up before, right? So listening to students, right? We have tons of students um, that speak every day about their experiences on campus. Um, 
that, and it's not, and it doesn't feel like an inclusive space to everybody, right? I think we take for granted that because we are fairly racially diverse, um, and because we're in a pretty diverse area, that students are going to feel welcome, and they don't, right? Our black students definitely don't feel welcome. Um, a lot of our Latino, Latinx, Latino, um, Hispanic students don't feel very welcome, right? Um, and there are other areas outside of that too where we could just listen a lot better. So, can you speak a little bit to what that uh, that is? That not feeling welcome. What 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 does that entail? Sure. Um, so, I mean, I've, in just in recent conversations that I've been having with, uh, you know, black graduate students as well as black undergrad, black undergraduate students, um, they talk about daily microaggressions that they're facing. Right. So people who are, you know, implying that they don't belong in certain spaces, they're treating them differently. Students in classes are making comments and uh, professors aren't checking those students who are making these really negative um, racialized comments. Right. Um, maybe because they don't understand that they should be saying something, right? So the, again, their experiences every day. And then we talk about uh, students, there are different places on campus where they feel more or less welcome, right? So certain areas um, in the student center or in other places uh, feel like spaces where people of color just can't congregate or can't come together because it's not for them. Um, we have students who talk about issues with um, a lot of the funding that happens. Uh, there have been shifts in the ways that student organizations in particular have been funded recently um, that are, again, because we're starting to throw everything into what diversity means, um, it's pulling money literally away or just limiting money further, right? Maybe that was historically uh, specifically earmarked to cater towards a black student population or one particular group. Now it's that same amount of money, not having changed, not having increased, is now being asked to be spread amongst a lot more students, right? And so then you still see huge disparities in terms of organizations who are getting funded and who are not. Dr. Inyeha. Yeah, just uh, um, you know, along the lines of what the previous panelists have said, um, I'll just emphasize one thing, um, faculty mentoring. It is not an easy task. Um, it is costly when it comes to, in terms of how much time it takes. Um, so perhaps departments or colleges specifically um, giving room for that as part of the FTE requirement. And I'm speaking, especially after my first year experience, I walked into my class and had two different um, students who looked like me come to tell me in that program as seniors, I was the first person who looked like them teaching them. And it made me decide, well, okay, um, there's a chance to mentor, feel free to come to my office, all of that. And whenever there was a need or help was needed, that did take time away from research and other things that you know I will be measured or evaluated by, for example. Um, so departments realizing that mentoring is important, it's key, and when you have a somewhat critical mass or a very few on the, men on the mentor end, I mean, it does take time and cutting some room for that, I think would be important. I think as a university um, or as a university on the whole, it's not enough to you know, form a diversity office, hire one person there, one you know, minority person, and then give them an office and a title. Um, talking about making cuts or pouring resources where we need them, it would be important to create that office and equip the people you put there. And beyond that, ensuring that in some way, shape or form, white faculty are part of the effort. Yes, that um, high ranking white faculty are part of the effort from building what that office would be like to hiring the you know, minority officers or whoever who would be there to working with them and supporting them. If they are not part of the efforts, what goes into hiring, like John said, doesn't change. It's still you know um, the boys club or whatever they call it. Um, so these kinds of measures, um, I think could get us closer to where we all hope to be. Wow, and I didn't have to pay you for that. Thank you, I appreciate that. I think that 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 is not, it's not rocket science, folks. We, if we got to put the money where the, where, where our mouths are, um, there's a question in the chat that I want to go to really quickly because I would like to see what your responses are to this. It says, "What are partnering? What are what about partnering with a white person who is supportive and co-presenting on these uncomfortable topics?" Uh, I can share from a little bit of an experience right after this whole, you know, what the senseless murder of George Floyd and conversations that happened. Um, these conversations are not easy. Uh, and the question, what about mentoring? Sorry, let me just read the question again. Who oh, is supportive? What about? Um, yeah, that's a good step to take. Um, the tension will be there. Um, you may 
end up not you know calling that person a friend or whatever <laughs> but i think it's a it's an important step to take if anyone shows interest in learning conversing asking questions trying to live in our bodies for a moment for a day um, take that person on and um, do whatever hand holding you might need to do early on but let them realize it's not going to be an easy journey and um, let them know engaging meaningfully will cost them. Sure, I, I would. Uh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Dr. I was going to say I appreciate your your thought in, in when you talk talked about you know having those discussions before, um, because sometimes I've I've had opportunities to do so, and because we were able to talk before before we co-presented. Uh, we, we talked about where we were both coming from. So when we presented, you know, we knew the status, each person stands on different aspects of whether it was racism, gender, whatever it is. So it, it's really important if you're going to co-present um, to have those discussions before so you understand each other's perspective. Jonathan, I feel like I caught you off. Oh, no, no, that's, that's fine. I was going to just jump in. I think you're, I, I agree with everything that you all are saying too, right? I mean, I think that's, these are, these are meaningful things that need to happen, right? And this goes back to this idea that um, we need white Americans everywhere to step, you know, kind of step up to the plate. And that doesn't mean that obviously there are many white Americans who have been doing this, right? Um, throughout history, I'm um, gonna continue to do this now, but yes, we, we do need that, right? Because the unfortunate, part of the unfortunate reality, right? Is that um, as people of color who study, research, talk about these things all the time, we often are still, again, relegated to this position of being people of color. And so, Oftentimes, many white Americans won't even listen to us when we're saying things, whether we have expertise or not. And so it can help to hear some of these same things from white people, right? Some white people are just only going to listen to other white folks, right? And you got to be able to work with that sometimes too, right? Um, that's not the only reason you would want that to happen, right? To have a, a to partner with a, a white individual, but that's one great reason that could add to it. So the question I have for you all is, what has this eight minutes and 46 seconds in time been to you? What impact has it had on your life? Yeah. I um, mean, that's, that's a hard one. I don't know if I, if I jump right back in there. Um, I mean, and so, I mean, I pause and I think because I mean, probably like many of you all, right? Uh, particularly, I would say, well, maybe not particularly, but definitely, right? Uh, specifically as well for black men, um, right? This is just a, such a part of the live reality, right? That for me, uh, seeing what happened to George Floyd, um, I mean, honestly, it was one of those, it's one of the situations again that just that made me cry, made me break into tears because this thing has happened over and over again. And this particular situation was something that we, I feel like we just were talking about a couple of years ago, right? Um, with Eric Gardner. And so like, I don't understand when we continue to see these things happen, right? It just continues to solidify for me uh, where, the, how far we have to go and the reality of my own tenuous existence here in America, right? That my life could be taken from me in the blink of an eye um, by a police officer, by a civilian, right? Uh, by anybody. Um, and not only could it be taken, that it wouldn't really matter in the same way that it matters for, for other people. Um, and so, I mean, it's, yeah, it's frustrating. It's depressing. Uh, saddens me and you know, kind of silences me in some ways too. One thing that uh, crossed my mind time and again uh, after hearing and reading about, I couldn't get myself to watch that video, um, is that uh, from looking at still shots, it's like, you know, one would ask which, what kind of a human being would not know that you know, sniffing life out of someone for that long will take life out. And it makes you wonder and ask, what was the intent? How often does this happen? Like John said, it, it just seemed like a conversation that was going on not too long ago. Um, uh, I don't even know if I can put words to describing the emotions 
that have been associated with just that number. Yeah. I I I had to I had to check out for a while after that. As the mother of a, a young African American ma young man, I had to really check out to address my own mental well-being. And, and then after that, when I checked back in, um, it was a, a certain level of hypervigilance, which, which, is, still, which is still here. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, my son works late, comes home at 10, and there have been some incidents of um, car break-ins in some of the neighboring um, communities around here. Um, and so a few nights ago, he said he was coming in and he saw there was a police officer parked right outside our street our home and immediately my mind is what if they thought he was breaking into the car he's just pulled in from work and it's dark out there and they pull him aside thinking that he was trying to break into either the car or the house and that's that was just how my mind that's just how my mind works immediately uh, and so I started turning lights on all lights outside of the house go on um, as soon as it starts to, to, the sun starts going down so that there's adequate light when he comes in, um, that if anything's happening, he can see and they can see, they can see him. And so for me, like I said, it, it had to check out because mentally, psychologically, it really got to me because of my, my position as the parent of a young black man. Um, but also then it caused me to be hypervigilant as well in ensuring that even if he's an adult, that's still my child. And I'm going to do whatever I can to stand in place for him for as long as, as I possibly can. How has any of this informed the work that you are now continuing to do in regards to social justice? My um, colleague, Rochelle, Joe and I uh, published, uh, did some a qualitative study not too long ago on the mental and physical health of African-American mothers who are raising um, boys and young men. And, and that is a study that we continue to talk about. And it's a study that actually she and I just this week talked now about getting the perceptions or the perspective of fathers fathers who are raising young boys and men. One of the, part of the result of the study was parental stress. Parents, like I mentioned in my own system, have been hypervigilant. So parenting styles being, um, being changed to address the safety of their, of their children. So I think just this incident have really fueled my um, desire to continue doing that type of research. Um, research supporting particularly um, black um, mothers, black women, and empowering them to, to recognize how systemic racism is affecting who we are physiologically. Um, in the black community, oftentimes we wait until we're almost ready to drop to the floor before we go to the doctor. So empowering black women to recognize that racism affects us not just mentally, but also physically. And there are things, there are steps that we need to take. So encouraging, seeking counseling, going to doctors, you know, before things get too, too, um, too late. So it's really fueled my, my research in that, in that way, in being a little bit more supportive, more advocacy for black mothers. Sure. Um, I would say, I think uh, most recently, one of the ways that everything that's been happening, right, um, has shifted some of the ways that I'm doing things is I, I, I do believe that, I mean, again, these are all tragic incidents, of course, like they continue to be tragic, you know, they continue to happen. But as I've observed, and, and uh, many of my friends and colleagues have you know, made similar statements, um, there seems to be something that's a little bit different this time. Um, not quite sure what it is, but there are things that are happening now that I don't think, well, I know didn't happen in the same ways, you know, in previous incidents. And so I've been really using this opportunity uh, as, as a time to speak up, right? Just not that I wasn't before, right? But I've kind of redoubled my efforts in terms of making sure that I'm, you know, engaging in more public scholarship or public work, uh, you know, trying to, to step up and do uh, public interviews or uh, at my church, right? I'm trying to talk to my pastors and other leaders about things that the church can do differently, right? To address some of these issues with racism, whereas maybe they haven't before. 
Um, just because, again, I feel like one of the things that is, is a byproduct of everything that's going on right now, um, just kind of the everything coming together with the police brutality on top of COVID and all this other stuff, is that it seems like people are willing to at least listen a little bit more than maybe they were in the past. Um, or some different people are willing to listen, maybe we'll say that. And so I'm just trying to use this time to speak up more. And so they tell me to shut up. I'm going to keep on talking, um, you know, and keep on pushing some of these things that I've been trying to push for. And even um, the using other people. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, just trying to do more. Um, I'll say two things. Uh, first, is not related to the question, but I must say that it is, um, it's been good to be in an academic circle and hear people relate um, questions on life and everything to faith in some way, shape or form. Just happens to be Christianity, but it's nice to see that that can be part of academic circles. I, I'm in STEM, um, and in the STEM disciplines, we typically don't talk about race matters. We just talk about the challenges and you know, very low pipeline. And obviously questions of faith don't even come up at all. So it's nice to be, um, to, to, to hear this. And the second thing, um, as it relates to the question and what, um, how this is shaping work and all of that, I think there's been more meaning in what I do from, from being present um, to being intentional and deliberate, um, you know, in an, in an academic circle, as opposed to you know, walking up somewhere in some company or startup and doing something like the pay cut or whatever, uh, is has more meaning associated with it. Um, and uh, in the video Victor played earlier, um, I think they mentioned the work of um, Brian Stevenson and the Equal Justice Initiative. Um, that's a group or an organization that I've been calling more people's attention to for the work they do. And I think with all that has happened and the questions people are asking, what can I do? You know, like, how can I be part of this? Um, that's been like there's there's been more activism activism on my side, calling folks' attention to opportunities such as supporting that organization. But in terms of my daily work as a researcher, scientist, mentor, teacher, there is more meaning, and there is more uh, there is more being deliberate and intentional in every little thing as it has to do with questions on race, um, diversity, inclusion, and engagement. Um, John said something very important one time. I'm sure there was a time in the US, um, maybe three, four decades ago, where uh, however long, when diversity had uh, very specific meanings, targets in very specific groups. In the last two, three decades, those groups have expanded. You know, women are minority, um, LGBTQ communities are minority, Hispanics, and more groups have joined in. And like he said, unfortunately, the resources haven't necessarily increased. This only results in like strain and everyone looking for what little they can get. Um, and while it's been a good thing that I think women have been able to come so far, um, I hope in the next few years, we can say the same about the black um, community. That's my hope. Amen to that. Uh, so I will ask you all, you know, it's really heavy. Um, the things that have been happening in, in our space and time. Not only what are you doing for self-care, but what do you wish for students at UCF and for those who are viewing right now to, to consider with regards to self-care? Um, I'll, I guess I, I can start off um, and offer a couple of things. So for me, one of the major things, um, and I think uh, Dr. Schillingford mentioned this a little bit earlier, just disconnecting, right? You got, I'd have to let go. Like I, there, are, there are times where I can, yeah, I can kind of feel, particularly disconnecting from like social media um, and other forms of just information that gets at us. And again, this has to do with the, the, the COVID thing as well that the pandemic is going on. So we're all kind of stuck at home where a lot of us are. Um, and so we just constantly get these feeds. And so a lot of times I just have to disconnect, right? Because you're constantly getting these, these images, these messages about all these different things. 
And for me, I study these things too, right? So it's just like a constant cycle. And sometimes I just have to let go, right? That might mean just turning off the computer, uh, turn it, I might just not do work for a day if, I, if that's what needs to happen, right? I'm just finding time to disconnect, to rest, um, so that my mind doesn't just keep going, that I'm not inundated by all these, these constant, the, the barrage of these things that are continuing to happen. Um, and for me, really just trying to find some kind of joy, right? Wherever that joy may be found, right? Spending time with my, my partner, uh, maybe my dogs, but it, doing, working on our house together, uh, you know, just talking to other people on the phone, just doing something that is different and that, again, that I derive some type of joy from um, to help kind of, you know, re refill my own tank, uh, my emotional tank, as it were. Um, so I would definitely, I, I do that. I would definitely suggest, you know, students and other people do that, right? Find time to take space, take things away from this. Um, and then uh, counseling. I mean, we hopefully all of us echo that same thing, right? Uh, particularly for a black community, which where, you know, it, it's just not seen as something that um, black people do, right? That's one of the kind of the stereotypes and that's part of the, of the culture, right? And so I think we're starting to get out of that, thankfully with some of the, the younger generations, but really pushing that, right? I'm a firm believer in counseling, you just can't work out some things by yourself. You need to talk to somebody about it and it, nothing wrong with it and it helps. So I say do it. So let me add something to this. Health disparities in the black community. And uh, right now we're hearing, wear your mask, wear your mask. What are you hearing in that message? Uh, yeah, I agree. Wear it. Um, <laughs> I wear mine everywhere. I, you know, if, if I go outside this house, I got my mask with me. Um, you know, and I uh, used to think, you know, I would look kind of silly doing that. But at this point, obviously, now I don't think that. And I feel like you're even, you look sillier, um, you know, if you're not. I don't want to get sick. I don't want to get anybody else sick. To me, it's a, it's not only self-care, but it's also care for the community, right? Which is a big deal for me as well, too, because um, it's more about keeping other people from getting sick as well and so yeah that's definitely a part of that health and self-care if you get covid kind of hard to continue with self-care it's gonna be on a ventilator so yes and, and you know in regards to students i i spoke with a student not too long ago who was telling me that they were experiencing it um for about two weeks at, at its worst feeling as though they were going to die every day um, and so it's very important that this message gets put out there that, you know, this is no joke. And um, so many of us maybe at the beginning of this thought it was a hoax and this and that, but with the lives being lost and people having people close to them um, passing on um, and not being able to, to really be at a funeral service or something along those lines to mourn um, has taken its toll. And so other panelists, your thoughts. Are we on, so on self-care or we're on the mass? <laughs> kind of a combination, self-care, <laughs> okay. mass. I will tell you, I went to the grocery store yesterday and I wore two masks. So I was extra careful. I wore my gloves. And then after I put the gloves on, before I picked up the, the rolling cart, I used the store sanitizer and sanitized my gloves. I mean, that might be overkill, but you know, I, I felt safe. Um, I went to, to the beach the other day. Uh, with that, I wanna say know your limitations. So that was a venture for me to go out to the beach and with every breath I took, although there were signs saying 10 feet apart, almost every breath I took, I kept thinking, is that wind blowing somebody's COVID my way? And so I, I had a hard time really 100% relaxing at the beach. So uh, I don't know that I will do that one again, but find spaces uh, to, to really relax. Get some sunshine, that's important. We have been, for some who have been inside for months now, go outside, ensure that you get some sunshine. Yeah, there are vitamin D supplements that we can take, especially people of color. Um, that vitamin D um, deficiency is, is something that we're susceptible to. So go out there when that um, Central Florida um, storm is not, it, it's, it's coming right now. So now might not be a good time. But when that sun is out, step outside just for a few minutes and, and get that, just let that sun um, and hit you. That's going to be very helpful to the to physical and mental health. Um, find your support system. Know who you can call on um, 
whether it's for emotional support, you're working on an article and you're, you're stuck. So find out what your needs are, what your support system is, and tap into those individuals. We've had several groups zooming in, um, just checking in with each other. We're doing that. In, in my profession, counselor education, there have been a lot of calls for social justice um, articles, special issue, and I'm thinking, whew, for years now, I've been trying to get my work published in top tier journals. And, you know, it's kind of like they have this quarter of diversity articles that they will publish. And now everybody wants submissions on, on articles. So I'm feeling good about that. So just finding things that are going to bring joy to you. Um, be grateful for your health. Be grateful for what you have, um, whether it's family, friends, whether it's health. Just being grateful and be compassionate to yourself. Um, not to echo what's been said already, uh, but disconnecting, like John mentioned, um, is one little thing I can do. And, you know, when I disconnect from everything else, spending time with my nine month old daughter um, and um, trying to see more reasons for what the fight is about and what we do. Um, uh, you know, I guess it's been a struggle on the faith side. And, you know, it's probably because the in finding or trying to identify with any faith community, you're looking for um, a community that sees you for who you are, and that, that welcomes you that sees you as one of their constituents. Um, that's been a challenge. Uh, but disconnecting has been the bigger thing. Um, we haven't figured out much of Florida to know where we can go into the woods or mountains and see more of nature or you know, connect with our human side in that way. But that's certainly something that's important and necessary. And for students, especially as the fall semester you know, slowly um, comes around the corner, um, it would be important to take that um, deep breather um, and you know, be human and be still for a moment. Nice, nice. So um, uh, there was a question or there was a thought in the in the chat about wearing masks as a, as a black male, and I, I, I'm not a panelist, but I, I will throw in there that um, there's something called CTSD, just continuous traumatic stress disorder, and I think in the black community, especially for males, that is something that presses on us constantly, I think is what Dr. Cox was talking about when he's saying um, about how, you know, just at any turn, you, you might be someone who's going to be shot or, or killed or whatever have you. And so there was these things that were happening before the pandemic in my life. But I remember going into Publix with my mask on and you know, maybe other people were thinking, oh, I got this mask on, it's silly, and da, da, da. But what was going on for me was I'm going into Publix and, and I hope they don't think I'm gonna steal something. And there's a reason why that was in my brain. And, and we have to think about that because that's a part of the systemic racism that I think is part of what's happening with this pandemic. So many people are saying this is a double pandemic for the black community. And I think the purpose for that is because all those traumatic things that have happened in our lives prior to this has created for us an uncomfortableness, a stress that then has something to do with our health. And it has something to do with everything else that matters in our life. And, um, and if we don't talk about it, like Jonathan said, and go to counseling and things along those lines, it can really have a, an adverse effect on us. And so that mask is so representative of so many things, I think, in the Black life. And so um, I wonder what your thoughts are when, when, in regards to wearing that mask and how you're seen. Sure. Uh, I mean, I think I, I responded in the chat to the individual who posted that, because I think that's something I think about as well, right? And I think for me, that one of the one of the most recent things, I guess we can say that that brought this to mind was, you know, the the, the murder of um, Ahmad Arbery, right? And so my I saw my, my wife and I just moved fairly recently, right, into a 
the surrounding neighborhood, like right around us, is significantly white. We're the only black people for sure in the in the couple blocks around us. Um, there might be a couple other kind of brown folks. I don't know. Um, and so I go, but one of the things I like to do often is to go running, right? I go running two or three times a week um, just around the neighborhood. And so I, I, I think about that constantly, right? Um, and so just the idea of you know running and having somebody chase me down, uh, and murder me, I'm always cognizant of what I'm wearing, um, what I'm doing. I try to make sure I'm smiling at people, right? Um, probably unnecessarily uh, waving at folks, trying to just have this happy appearance. So you're smiling with your think. eyes, you're doing one of those Right, you know, exactly, things. right? You know, so when I put a mask on, to me, that's just an additional layer, right, of, uh, of concern, because now you can't, maybe you can't see the smile if I have a mask on, right? You can't, you can't really see what's going on behind that. Um, there's the tropes about black men, right, being dangerous, right, criminals. And so, yeah, are you gonna look at this black person running around or being outside wearing a mask and say, why is he even in this neighborhood? The rest of the black folks live all the way over there. Why is he here, right? And so the, the, this, this is a major concern for me, right? Is what, what are people gonna say? What are they gonna do? What are they gonna, how are they gonna respond to me? If you, know, you can't, if I can't even give these cues that I shouldn't have to give anyway, uh, that I'm not a threat, right? Uh, it, yeah, I, I, I'm very, very concerned about that all the time. You know, it's really interesting. You brought up that thing, right? Um, so there's this terrorism that's in our in our community as well. And I think about you at the age of seven, eight, nine, maybe four or five, and when it turned and changed from you being a cute kid to you being a threat. Mm -hmm. And 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 that's the thing that's constantly again it goes back to that stress, right? That we have in our minds is that you know people don't see me as that cute kid anymore. People don't see me as that. You know, they used to call me a teddy bear, right? They don't see me as that teddy bear anymore because now I'm intimidating and I'm this and I'm that. And so thank you for sharing that, Jonathan. Others? I, I wanted to chime in with, with Black women uh, and, and girls also. There may not necessarily be aspects of, of police profiling like the, the Shirley mentioned in the, in the chat, but there have been so many times when I have been told, you need to smile. Why are you so serious? Um, I have had colleagues come up to me to go uh, to ask me about other um, African-American students. Why is she so quiet? You should tell her she needs to smile more because if I'm on a, um, a committee where she's looking for a job and she looks that way, I'd have to reconsider giving her that job. And so that mask puts an extra layer on there for us as well that you know that person is so very serious that I see them as a threat. So if you're not smiling to make somebody comfortable, uh, you are a threat. So wearing a mask also, at least in, in my mind, adds that layer of discomfort for others. And, and so I start to think about how is it, how do they view me when they see me wearing, especially not my one, but my two masks, um, what is it that people think about me uh, when I walk out there. So that's something that I am also conscious of as I move around. I, I don't have to, and I don't necessarily want to walk around smiling. I'll smile on the inside, you know, like they say in the church song, smile on the inside. Um, but I don't necessarily feel like I have to smile just to make people comfortable. But it also puts me in a, in a space of, of, of potential danger if people are uh, feeling unsafe because of who I am or how I perceive, they perceive me to be. You no, know, the thing that it, uh, it strikes me is with that is like you. There was a question about how to um, be an ally or, or anti-racist, right? And so I think a part of that is also not expecting that smile, right? And so sit with that discomfort, right? That person's not smiling at you. Talk to them anyway. Uh, that doesn't mean that they're upset. That means that maybe they're and in, and in, in, they're thinking something. They're off somewhere else, you know, um, and, oh, and maybe I'm just minding my business. Ooh, OK, well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> We've got to learn that one, too. <laughs> Dr. Inyaha. Yes, uh, I, I wear a mask going out. Um, I can understand uh, folks who feel folks, especially, you know, black men who feel like this is um, just another way of being harassed for people who harass them for not wearing masks. Um, I think it's it wouldn't be fair uh, to ignore you know the history and different ways in which um, they've been particularly targeted um, to say well opposing wearing a mask now is just you know being stubborn or, or something else. I wear one. Um, um, having studied epidemics a little bit, uh, 
you know, there are um, serious dangers in each person not playing their part. And if I can protect myself a little bit or protect others, if I don't know, for example, that I'm a carrier, then it's just the right thing to do. Early on, it was a little awkward to walk into public spaces where so many people are not wearing masks, especially in Florida, um, and, uh, you know, be like the only one and, um, you know, be looked at like, is this really a big deal or is that really going to help you? Um, I think it helps. I wear one. I encourage people to wear one. Thank you. So we're coming up to the end of our time. So I have one last question and then I want to open it up to our audience for the rest of the time to be able to, to, to come in, talk, speak, have questions, have thoughts about what has been going on here. Um, I want to thank again the people out in YouTube land. Um, really appreciate you hanging in there with us. Um, so the last question for you all, how will you know change occurred? What does holistic excellence look like? How do you redesign and reinvent transformational excellence? So how do, will you know that UCF has made a difference in the lives of students, staff, faculty, administrators when it comes to race relations? So let's ask the deep questions first, ma'am. <laughs> Sorry, what did you say, Anne? She wants she me to, to go ask thing. the deep questions first. <laughs> <laughs> Especially since we might have to call out UCF on this one, right? <laughs> well, one one thing crossing my mind um, is, um, you know, I don't think any one of us or whoever engages on this topic is unrealistic to expect, um, you know. Um, a, a society in which um, there are no racial tensions or aggressions or you know micro aggressions for example or where everyone is perfect telling me I I I mean more than they I ever have I don't think we're you know imagining an unrealistic scenario um, but to measure um, success on this topic at UCF would mean um, students graduating and having a much better holistic, um, deeper understanding of matters surrounding these topics. And in their professional workspaces, um, being able to, at the very least, at the very least, speak up when they see um, um, uh, unjust type events or you know, racially motivated comments or things like that being made. Um, it would show that in the four years or so they've been here, they understood better the problem. They decided they would be, um, if not frontline champions, not bystanders, right? And I think it would be on us faculty members to in whatever way we could have helped through the process, have students get there. Others? Um, so I would say a couple of things that I would add to that um, would be, um, one, I'll know that I would know that change has occurred um, and that where UCF in general is doing a lot better if uh, when the, the student body and faculty and staff uh, population like mirrors the actual population, but not only mirrors the population, right? So bringing the numbers in terms of representation up, um, but exceeds it, right? I mean. If, if you can exceed the goal, like the, the baseline standard of mirroring the population, then I guess to me that would show that you actually have a, a, a true commitment to addressing issues that have existed for a long time. I would also really think that if UCF, uh, it would help if re UCF reconsidered um, and maybe even reformulated the entire strategic plan, uh, particularly with regards to diversity. Um, but in the midst of doing that, also adequately considers all university processes and practices that run counter to those strategic goals, right? Um, we, we have a lot of, uh, there are things that are happening on campus, I'll say, that seem to run pretty counter to the goals that we have for increasing diversity and increasing the feelings of inclusion, right? And I don't think that, that those are intentional, right? But if we actually were to shift that, 
um, to shift those goals, then we maybe would actually have a place where students don't feel uncomfortable, they feel welcome, they feel like they can breathe their whole selves, they feel like the entire campus is for them, they feel represented, they're not waiting until their, their last class to have a Black professor or another professor that looks like them, right? So I think those are some of the things that I think that would actually showcase that. We've actually moved the needle with regards to race um, and other issues um, on campus. And I echo um, what my both, co both my colleagues have mentioned. I would also say that um, having inclusion of diversity discussions in if not all, but most programs, um, that would be a big take. So not having one course that students check off to say I've met that diversity um, balance, but having that be an inclusive part of who we are as UCF, having the discussions, having faculty feel comfortable um, talking about issues of diversity uh, within their classes, within communities, during faculty meetings, and, and so on. I think that would go a long way. And also with the representation, increase in representation that, um, that Jonathan mentioned. Thank you. And see, it wasn't that hard. <laughs> you, all, you all knocked that out the box. And so. <laughs> Um, that is going to bring us pretty much to conclusion. And I want to thank you three for your phenomenal words and for sharing a little bit of who you are with um, our viewing public. And I ask our viewing public to go out and, and, and engage in these kind of conversations and, and, and know that this is not just for show. This is really about us making changes in our lifestyle and encompassing and embracing and loving on one another in such a way that we do make the systemic racism that is apparent within the United States, not just at UCF, different. We always talk about we want to make this the benchmark university. We want to be the leaders, the 21st century university. Well, in order to be able to do that, we have to be about it. And so I, I need and I invite you all to come and share in it. You know what, there's gonna be some painful moments. There's gonna be some times where you're misunderstood or you might say something that you don't wanna say or that you say that comes out the wrong way and misinterpret it. You know what, we all have to go through that. But I ask you to do it with the kindness of heart that you know that you're doing it for the right reasons. And if you wanna be my brother and you wanna be my sister, the way that you can do that is be my brother and be my sister. There's not a, a quid pro quo for this. This is really about us being there for one another. And so I wanna invite my panelists back in. And, uh, and if there are any questions or anything coming from the audience, those of you who are on our Zoom call, please feel free. Um, we'll go to a point where everybody can even come in and show your faces. You know, we're, we're opening up the room and um, we just want to enjoy each other for these last minutes that we have together. And I hope that we were able to fulfill for you all uh, just a little bit of something coming from UCF to our UCF community about what it's like to kind of deal with life during this pandemic and, and, and what happens in the lives of black folks. We're, we're bearing our souls. We do that a lot. And, um, and we want you to learn how to bear your soul as well. And so any questions, any thoughts, please come on in. And um, there was a, a form that was put into the um, chat asking you all to kind of fill out so we can have um, some data um, with regards to um, how many people have been here. So if you would be able to do that, um, please um, do that in the chat. And, um, and again, thank you for joining us, but I'm gonna turn it over to Victor to close us out and open the floor up to questions. Thank you. Once again, thank you so much, Dr. Butler. Thank you for all the panelists. Um, we are grateful that what started from just a thought has actually come to reality. I remember when I was brainstorming just in my study room and I shared it with Dr. Butler and he gave a go ahead that we can have this conversation. I want to welcome everyone back. I have a couple of questions that um, I have myself. I'm from Nigeria, by the way. So I just came to the US last year. So I'm barely a year in the US, you know, and I'm having, you know, getting to engage this community of wonderful 
intellectuals to see how to change the narratives on how to help the African American communities and also the other, you know, minority race. Um, everyone in the room now, I know that I have about 80% doctors in this room. They are all PhD, you know, they've done well and for themselves and they've been able to push beyond the racism, the fights, the struggle. My question is, how did you do it? And if one or two or three persons can answer this question, it will help the students who are watching. That's fine, I'm an African-American student. I am being marginalized in invited comma. I feel disenfranchised, you know, but be, because the, the goal is not to stay or to stop along the way. The goal is to get to the destination. The goal is to be excellent. The goal is to achieve greatness. What do I need to do so that I don't lose the goalposts despite all the systemic, you know, issues that we have? If one, two, three persons can answer. Uh, let, me, let me see if I can just tackle that really quickly, right? I will tell you this. One, stay humble. Mm -hmm. Stay hungry. Do this for the right reasons. Do it for yourself and no, no one else, right? You have to want this goal. But the reason for humbleness is that if you get ahead of yourself and you think you're so great in your own brain, you will lose your way. And, and you need to stay focused and you need to know why you're in this and why you want to move in that regard. Um, but humbleness is, is my go-to. Thank you very much, Dr. Butler. Someone else? I'm going to be giving this feedback to our students. So number one is stay humble, stay focused. So I need, I would welcome the white community or other, those from the our Latino brethren, if they can also help put, you know, how, how did you achieve your PhD? There were issues along the way. There were challenges. There were issues of racism. How did you push? Because this is a mentoring session now and the students want to hear practical lessons on how to get to the destination. Maybe I will ask Ms. Dr. Oh. Joseph Meyerson. Dr. Joseph Meyerson can help us. I have to call names this time. <laughs> I'm actually Mr. Not Doctor, sir. Okay, okay, Mr. <laughs> You're welcome to give us your feedback, sir. Uh, well, you know, I just, uh, I, I'm a person whose uh, lack of dermal melanin is so catastrophic as to be cancer inducing. But uh, as I'm an observant Jew, I'm not as white as I look. So all I can say is that my experience for my entire life, and I was brought up in the South during the time when Jim Crow was uh, the law of the land, and one of my earliest memories as a child is walking uh, with Hazel Little, uh, a black woman who raised me, uh, and uh, being forced off the street by uh, a white man, and my wanting to go and kick him in the knees, and Hazel grabbing me and restraining me and explaining to me, no, that's just the way things are. And for my entire life, I have been disgusted and frustrated and infuriated by the overwhelming lack of understanding by America as a whole that the foundational sin of America is chattel slavery. And as the physical benefit of that awful crime is still being used and benefit derived from it by our society, that our society fails to realize the central necessity of overcoming that. And I can think of nothing besides reparations and re-education that will accomplish that. And it took four centuries of institutionalized malice and evil to achieve the level of just complete permeation in every aspect of society of institutionalized racism that 
I, I honestly think that until we give it the same sort of national focus that we gave the race for the atomic bomb or the race to reach the moon, and we make it that kind of national priority, I think that we're going to continue to suffer from the effects. I gain a lot of hope and a lot of pleasure and pride by what I see happening now, but I also see that the focus on Black Lives Matter is seemingly fading and a new focus is developing uh, that's distracting from the, the critically important work of establishing racial justice. Wow, that's, that's deep. Thank you so much for that feedback, sir. Uh, I don't know if Dr. Rivera can you know, help us tell, tell us how he was able to push through the narrative, the hurdles of academic work. You did not drop out after your first degree. You pushed towards, I don't know if he's there, Dr. Rivera. Okay. I don't know if you can see me, hear me. Yeah, we can, we can, sir. Yeah, so I mean, I, I kind of like my experience. So I went from Puerto Rico to Nebraska. So that was my, my experience in dealing with everything. Uh, so I had a particular set of circumstances. Uh, you know, this is sort of uh, where your peers and, and your mentors are important uh, in looking at this. So I echo that. I was fortunate enough that I had a, a group of people that really were invested in me. And I think that that drove a lot of the things that uh, I had to do uh, to make sure that I return a winner, right? Uh, sometimes when you come from a small place and an island and you go to, you know, the states and all sort of stuff, there's sort of kind of like this responsibility on top of you. So that was kind of like a, an issue I've, I've uh, always uh, used to, to drive me forward as well. Uh, and sort of listening, understanding, and, and sort of taking some of the lessons that were provided here today and reaching out, right? I think sometimes uh, we have this tendency to go at it alone uh, and not necessarily share what you're feeling or what you're uh, expecting. And sometimes, you know, it, it takes, you know, it takes a lot of courage, but sometimes you have to uh, step out of your, your, your comfort uh, zone and actually ask for help. Because we don't know every, everything, right? Especially as a, as a grad student, uh, you know, you have these particular experiences and you necessarily have the models out there, right? Uh, uh, I cannot go and, you know, talk to my dad and say like, hey, what was it like in grad school or anything like that? I don't have that, uh, that background or anything like that. But I do know that there are a lot of people that were invested in me and kind of have that opportunity to actually uh, follow through. So thank you, uh, everyone, for, for uh, a great panel today. Thank you so much. I just want a female perspective this time. How did you push through the difficulty of grad school? You know, your research, how did, were you able to work with your professors well and, you know, finally come out refined as a doctor? I don't know if Dr. Rian Brees is there, if she can contribute to this question. Dr. Brees, is she there? If she's not there, if someone else, Dr. Kelly? Ryan Bryce is who you're calling out. Yes, Dr. Ryan Bryce. I don't know if she's there. Yes, I'm here. Okay. Um, I think as I came from a very rural community, um, so I think being a woman in a rural community, it was not common for women to um, seek high, a lot of higher education um, at a higher level. And I think just um, dedication, um, perseverance are some of the traits that I think. And just, again, the mentorship that um, faculty provided um, really made a difference. Um, I had a lot of support actually from my community. I got a lot of scholarships. So applying for scholarships is one of the ways that, I mean, I originally I taught um, eighth grade English. And one of the things I focused on this in this rural community is there were a lot of um, very poor 
families and none of them at even at eighth grade had even thought about going to college. So encouraging them to get scholarships was one of the things I did. So when I continued my education for um, my master's and my PhD, I did seek out and obtain a lot of scholarships, which gave me the motivation to do really well in my studies because I thought that was important. Um, I champion everything that everyone in this group is doing. Um, you know, and I, I think UCF is one of the institutions that really strives to do better. And we're all in this to increase awareness and champion the cause because we are all um, traumatized by the eight minutes and 46 seconds. We are traumatized by it. And we're here to, to work together to change things. Thank you so much, Dr. Bryce. So my next question will be about the STEM course. I looked at a, a disturbing research work uh, from the National Science Foundation website. And I found out that a lot of African Americans do not finish, you know, in terms of population size, the size of um, African Americans who finish up to the doctoral degree in STEM courses is quite low. I don't know if um, we want to talk about how we can encourage our African Americans and minority race to appreciate the STEM program. Because if we're going to change a lot of narratives, innovate wise in the you know in science engineering, we need more representation. So I don't know if Dr. Inyoha can put a voice. I know he's an engineering PhD scholar and doctor, sorry. Um, he would be able to advise us how we're able to, you know, push beyond the perceived racism in that field. So uh, this may hopefully respond to your question now and the first one you asked a little bit. Um, one thing that does help is to realize that at the end of the day, we're all human, right? And um, when we're in school, what someone is struggling with, even if they don't say anything, other people are probably struggling with the same thing. During my PhD program, every once in a while when we got the chance to hear of fellow students' frustrations and um, you know, difficult times, especially in the um, second and fourth and fifth years, um, there was a sense of hope, meaning if people go through what you're experiencing and end up finishing, you can, right? You can. Um, and as a faculty member, it's one of the things I try to let my you know, struggling students know, regardless of what race they come from, but especially African-Americans who make it all the way to my office to talk about a concern or whatever. Um, we, I let them know, you know, it's a tough road for anyone who hasn't seen this material before. And especially since I teach um, courses that are more mathematical if folks haven't seen it before, it's a struggle. Once you see it the first time, you see it the second time, it becomes a little easier. Um, but just realizing that if something is new, it is new to everyone. Every child has to um, crawl and walk and fall and learn to stand. I'm um, just knowing that being black doesn't make that only a black problem, um, gives you hope and lets you know that somehow, despite the extra challenges you have to deal with, that others don't, you can still, you know, give it all you have. And like um, Kent said earlier, just stay laser focused on, on the goal. Thank you so much. Listen, um, Rich, Victor, yes, sir. I, need to, I need to step in for a moment and I apologize for, for doing this, but we're, we're going to need to wrap up. Okay. Um, so um, the folks who are out in YouTube, land um, just know that the the live stream is going to end shortly uh, we have till about 320 and so i just wanted to make sure that we kind of wrap up um and and be mindful of everyone's time um who have been behind the scenes helping us with this particular webinar and so victor um close us out thank you everyone for your time and we really appreciate you being here 
Thank you so much once again, everyone. This, you know, event was organized by the Legacy, you know, mentoring program here at UCF. Um, Legacy is actually a baby project of the ODI, you know, um, Department of, you know, Office of Diversity and Inclusion. So we are actually geared towards helping the underrepresented, you know, folks here on campus to, you know, provide them with mentorship, provide them with leadership, and provide them with a support, you know, and a show that they can lean on. You know, you're all welcome to help us refer students who are struggling, you know, under you to, you know, reach out to us. We have mentors on our, on our, you know, on our database that we can pair them with. And we've had fantastic stories and, you know, excellent reports, you know, over the years. And we want to continue that story, we want to continue that impact. And that's why we held this event beyond the content that was shared. It's also an awareness to letting you know that legacy exists on campus and we're here for our students and we're here for you as well. Thank you once again. I don't know if anyone has um, something to say. Let me just say one more thing really quickly. Um, thank you, Victor, um, for your time. Thank you, Kavita and Allison and Carly, all those behind the scenes. Um, you really, really have helped to make this uh, Rockstar webinar. Um, all the panelists, thank you. To the viewing public, um, be on the lookout in the next couple of days. You will see the results coming out from the campus wide um, culture and climate survey. And um, we will be having town halls around that information and where our university is moving strategically with that information at hand. And so thank you all. Um, and um, stay positive and recognize that um, um, your voice is just as important to this as anyone else's. Um, Victor. Thank you so much. On this note, I would like to call it a day. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. I look forward to seeing you next time when we invite you for any event here. Yeah. Thank you. And yeah, have yeah, we're going to do this more. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Will someone save the chat, please?